cara, para tu pueblo ahí, ¿entendés? Y wifi. Un wifi. ¿Dónde tú estabas? All right, so we live now. Let me just call my dude so you can put it on the website. Give me a second. Un traguito, pues yo pensé que tú ibas a tener todo eso. Eso es raro, porque no tenés, lo estaba pasando con Ponte, güey. Yo metí uno en la nevera ahí. Se le se pasaron. Oye, ya no, no le diga nada. Ya debe venir a todo el diciendo: No vamos a pasar contigo, que no le llevamos un robo. Como Ivy, Adri. ¿Qué? Como Ivy. ¿Cuál es el menos? ¿Cómo fue? Y tú te pones como Ivy, que la voz. De lo que me gusta hablar de vacabol, que es lo que me gusta. No, no. Con el rojo, con el rojo. Por eso mismo. No me lo que hablo de vacabol. Yo nunca había montado el chat. Ahí es que me mata. Aquí no tiene que ver coronavirus, porque mira cómo vive la gente. Lejísimo de cada uno. So we got some time to kill because they're putting it up on the website now. So it should be up like in two minutes. Uh, right. Pero Ricky, let me hit him up. Yeah, yeah. You gotta turn your camera on. Why does my video stop? Because you, uh, you. you gotta turn your camera on. Uh, how do I do that? There's like a little uh, camera thing. To it should be to your left hand side. It, it says mute, and then it says stop video. So James, yo, your video is stopped, and then it has the like the, the this, so like the. Yeah, you just gotta press see, the video. I don't see no camera. Ah, uh, hola, let me see if I see you. Yo, James. Ah, pues usted se está poniendo ready que se van a montar un avión, ¿eh? Usted se va a montar un avión. <laughs> Yo, I, I don't know, bro. Hey, no bro. te guille, papi, no te guille. No te guille. No te guille. A mí me mandan... No te guille. Me mandan un email. de que, oye, que los jugadores que van para allá, que van a ir. Yo, ¿cómo? ¿La liga va a empezar? También. Que van a dos meses, de que un hotel... En un hotel dos meses, dije, cerrar y tú vas a jugar Nintendo. Dije, que... Too little, too late, <laughs> mi hermano. Nah, nah, pues, I, I go back, I'm going to find out tomorrow or Monday. Yeah, but they, they clear the league already or no? Yeah, they're going for it. I'm niggas just talking about, like, you need to leave, like, Monday, like, the nah, 15, nah. May 15 and all that. Nah, May 17, but I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to try to back, like, the 20 or 21st if I do go. They told me, he was like, yo, like, you know the whole situation about that? And um, I was like, listen, man, I never played it. So she's selling it right now. I'm in. So it's me. I'm trying to. Yo, but they got looking for players too, Adri. I know, because a lot of players not going to go. Tu me entiendes? Exactly. exactly. They're looking for players where? Down there. Like other teams that like the, the American. For what league? For Israel. Israeli league. Oh yeah, yo, uh, Gelvis hit me up and told him that uh, that they hit him up in Israel too. Yeah, teams just looking. Yeah, looking bro. Like I'm telling you, bro. All right, so, they, All right, so they looking uh, for players. Let's just for... wait for Ricky right now. Let me see. Where he at. Hmm. Pero oye, yeah, bro, pero eso está raro, loco, porque de que tú tienes que durar dos meses, de que dos semanas. Yeah, de que dos semanas, quarantine, and then... De que for the shit to end, de que the end of July. Uh, uh. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, they pushing it, they pushing it, you know what I mean? Yeah. But nigga, they're going to pay me, I'm out. 
Of course, of course. It come down to that too. Pero... Yo, you gonna end in July to turn right back around in August, Jay? Nah, if I, if I do when I get back to Jerusalem, I'm not going back to September. So let me ask you, so they doing this to finish the, the, the lead? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so now all the team is going to be on it then? Right? Yeah, yeah. Nah. <laughs> now all the team is going to be in it because how are they going to finish it? <laughs> what you mean? Una they they got to get the players to come back first, Adri. That's not happening. My una nigga, not even... Nah, that's, that's crazy because vamos a tener que durar 14 días en una habitación. Después de eso, you need to get in shape porque créeme que you only need two days to get out of shape. Ay, <laughs> that's a so fact. Dame ver. Con dos días yo tengo el tecito, brand new. That's what I mean. Yeah, bro. Like, that's, that's crazy. Yo, we on live right now? Yeah, we've been on live. Ah, but... Ah, pero nosotros estamos hablando aquí como que... I'm lying, children. I won't be returning back to work. I'm just no, playing. no, no. They're, they're just getting the link now. They just get. Okay. Just getting the link now. Sorry for the little trouble. Yeah. Trouble shooting issues. Aquí, but... <laughs> um, we got, we got, we got. Where Ricky at? Where Ricky at? Uh, I text him. So we got. Right now, I don't know. I probably got like 60 people watching right now. Nice. Hi, um, Adri, it's internet to you in Santo Domingo, Papa. Ah, I'm on the Wi Fi OD. Yes, a tiger is a cadaver. Yeah, see it. Yeah, see the live right now is on the website. All right, so, so let's do this. Um, I don't know where Ricky uh, is. He just, he just texted me to send him oh, the no. link. But... Well, we'll get him back later. So, uh, everybody, thank you for participating. Um, we're going to have to edit and, and chop and screw this video up a little bit. Um, so, after the live, I'm going to take this video down and I'm going to make something a little different because uh, this live, there's, there's some things we got to cut out. Um, but basically, what, what we're trying to discuss today is uh, what it takes to be a pro, right? Um, uh, we have different individuals here that represent different um, times, different eras, and different skill sets. Um, I want to introduce everybody to Matt Mendez. Matt is a, a pro writer. Um, he's out of Arizona who currently published a book um, that I'll be making sure each one of you get about, um, uh, uh, I believe it's two youth, right? One that plays yeah. basketball and one that's not so good. And uh, he, he wrote a book around basketball and sports. Uh, he'll get into that a little later. So um, I wanna introduce everybody to the panel to my left. Um, I don't know if everybody's seeing it the same way. I have um, Adriz de Leon, uh, Matt Mendez, James uh, Feldin, and Edgar Sosa. Uh, and we'll be discussing today what it takes to be a uh, what it takes to be a pro. What does that mean? Um, there's not necessarily a blueprint in life on how to accomplish certain uh, uh, how to get from point A to point B, but there are certain uh, uh, ethics and 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 a work commitment that people have to uh, put in in order to be able to to reap these type of benefits. So with that being said, uh, we're going to start with an introduction. Um, I usually don't like to talk on people and who they are. I'm going to ask everybody the same question. Uh, who, who are you? Uh, you know what I'm saying? And we could start off to my left. Go ahead. Is that me? Is that me? Is me? Okay. Yeah. okay. So my name is Adris de Leon. Um, I was born in the Dominican Republic. I'm Dominican, and I went to school four years at Eastern Washington. And now I'm a professional basketball player. All right, cool. Thank you, Adri. Uh, Matt? Uh, Matt Mendez. I'm originally from uh, El Paso, Texas, and uh, now I live in Arizona in Tucson. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a writer. I love to read, and uh, I like to help out kids. I write uh, books for uh, young adults. James? My name is James Feldin. I was born in Washington Heights, New York. Um, I'm Dominican, like Adris. And, and now I'm a professional basketball player. Uh, and James? Uh, Edgar? 
Hello, everyone. My name is Edgar Sosa, and I was born and raised in Dykeman, New York. Um, yeah, and I'm a professional basketball player now. <laughs> All right. So we have a, a whole bunch of professionals here. Um, now, my question, uh, my, my follow-up question would be um, uh, early childhood. Uh, what did early childhood look like? Uh, what did you envision uh, growing up? And uh, as we, so basically to break it down, we're trying to do a timeline. So um, in order to understand where you got, let's see where you were prior to that. So what we're going to try to do for the youth, on, uh, the youth watching this is for them to understand that every road has a beginning. What, what do some of these beginnings look like? Um, so uh, I'll start this one off with you, Edgar. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you say uh, growing up, um, one, influenced you, uh, but number two, helped you understand and, and, and develop that hunger to be more? Yeah, um, to answer your question, the first one, the influence I would have to say is my brother. Uh, just growing up, wanting to be just like my brother. My brother used to play baseball, and then he just started playing basketball. And me wanting to be like him, I picked up a basketball. And, and what drove my hunger, I would say, will have to be just the passion to to want to be good at the sport. I think when I was younger, I didn't know too much about college. I didn't know too much about pro. I just knew that, you know, when basketball was talked about in my area or even in New York, I wanted to be one of the players that they spoke about. Mm. So in order to get to that level, it took a lot of hard work. It took a lot of me battling against other players and, and, and showing my worth. So I think my hunger came from there to, to begin with. Okay. Uh, James? Uh, like like Edgar said, my older brother played basketball uh, too, like, you know, playing in the park and stuff. And I just wanted to be like him when I was growing up. Um, like I always say, if he played baseball, football, I would I would have tried to play those sports. Um, but then after time, you know, I, become, I started becoming good and, I start. I knew my work ethic would um, would get me to this point, so I just knew how to work hard. And having friends like Edgar, and now that he's seeing them work hard every day, and you know, it pushed me to to become. Okay, and now Matt, uh, you're part of a conversation that 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 brings in a a, a unique, uh, I would say, component, which is. Uh, being a professional you know, doesn't require um, individuals to only pick up the ball, the basketball, right? But the ability to pick up a, a, a pen or a laptop and be able to write a story that might be pertaining um, to, to sports. Uh, so I want you to tap in uh, to talk a bit about your book. What's your book about? And, and Matt Mendez, what, what led to, to that book being written? So I think like what Edgar and James are saying is as a kid, I grew up in El Paso, right on the frontera. I'm not sure if everybody knows where El Paso is. I'm a Chicano, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a Mexican-American. But right there in El Paso, you're right, you're right along the border. So you have, you know, friends from Juarez and from Mexico, and you get it's this rich, vibrant area. And I grew up in a part of El Paso. It's like kind of a poor area. And basketball was something me and my friends would play all the time. And we just love the game and love the sport. And, you know, a lot of my friends are the real chaparritos. They're really short. And, you know, there's not a lot of us that are going to go pro playing ball. And uh, while we were sitting there playing and loving the game, going to college and getting to that next level wasn't in the future for a lot of us. But as I, as I grew up and uh, ended up joining the military to pay for college, because I knew I wasn't going to be able to pay for that on my own. I knew if I had to make it, I was going to have to, you know, scrap and work full time in order to, you know, get through high school get through college and do the things I wanted to do when I turned back and started reading and writing and loving books I knew I wanted to go back and tell those stories of those young people who grew up in the neighborhood that I grew up in and kind of show the lives they had and the passions they had and that passion they had with basketball and you know the kind of community they had and the love they had for the game and the love they had for each other mm. and and could you also share with us what's the title of the book it's called barely missing everything Okay, so um, as far as barely, uh, as far as your book is concerned, which we are going to make sure that each uh, each of the panelists uh, receive a copy, um, what would you say is the message you're trying to get out uh, via the book? It's a book about uh, two young boys growing up and them, you know, trying to you know make it in an environment that's really tough. They're they're two best friends and they they love each other. And it's about you know becoming a man and growing up and sticking together even though you know odds are hard. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Absolutely. Uh, 
Adris. Um, my story was a little different. Like, like, like James and Edgar, my, my older. Um, we grew up in DR as a kid, mm -hmm. and um, and he was the one that really introduced me to the game. And um, I wasn't that good, but like I said, my brother wasn't that good either. But it's like the love for the game really got me to to push myself, you know. So when I came to the United States when I was nine nine years old, like basketball was really really famous in the United States and. And that's when I really, I, I, I never thought about being a pro or going to college or or just making money doing this. Just the love of the game gave me my hunger to just keep pushing myself with it. Okay. And here, um, I, here I am. Sir. Yeah. So, so to follow up with that, um, now we're looking at like these are these are these are the developmental stages where we started to identify. Um, I'm developing a, 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 an appreciation because love, I'm assuming, came through the, traje the trajectory of it, not necessarily in the initial stages. But how would you say, um, what was it that transpired that led to this understanding of, oh, I could actually um, compete. Um, I could actually uh, pursue a career in this. Um, and I would say thinking about ages, I would say 10 to like 15, which is, I would say 10 to 13, right? Because once you hit eighth grade um, and, and high school, that's when all the politics begin. Um, but let's say like that, mm -hmm. those middle school, uh, sixth through eighth grade, you're hooping, um, just just hungry to, to, to be nice um, and, 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 and to develop that, that name for yourself. Um, what would you say was was a, a determining factor for you to be able to to to, to turn that kill kill switch on and say, yo, I can actually make something out of this? Um, we'll start off with you, James. Uh, so my story is a little, I mean, it's a little different. Um, like you say, that love and that that idea of becoming a pro didn't come to my head until I was a sophomore in college. So from that age, you say ten to thirteen. I was just having fun with my friends. You know, back in the day, me and Edgar were friends back then. So we were just having fun, you know, playing in the parks, um, not really working out like that. We were just trying to be in the playground, just, you know, just playing basketball. Um, and then, like you said, the politics came in and, you know, I, I was never, I never had a big name when I was growing up. Um, I was always under the radar. So being a pro professional never came to my head. I just wanted to have fun and follow my brother's footsteps. But then when I got to college, when I became better at, over time, um, that's when I realized I could be a pro. And then that's when that kill switch came on. Mm. Um, how about for you, Adri? You said you were a late bloomer. Um, uh, what would you, what, what, what was those initial stages? I would say those, those middle school, uh, that middle school time frame. what would you say uh, was a contributing factor to, to pursuing basketball and knowing that this is something you could play? I mean, when I when I I was a late bloomer, like you said, like I didn't play middle school, high school. I didn't play high school, and just. Well, no, that you might, you, 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 you. And looking at that, yeah. you're cutting you off. Me or no? Now you could repeat it. I, I mean, what I said was like, Lou Flor was that inspiration that he gave me. Like, I saw well, no, Lou he... Flor is like a big brother, you know? And you're, he looking you're, at him. You know? You're cutting in and out, Adri. Can y'all hear me or no? So, what I'll, now we could. I'll, I'll get back to you, all right? Um, so, Edgar, yeah. uh, you were the actually the complete opposite. Um, what I would say about you was you had the hype, you know? Yeah. What I mean? Coming out of uh, junior high school, Shit, if you, like, oh, pardon the French, but if you didn't know who, who Edgar Sosa was, it was like you weren't outside, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, having the complete hype, what would you say was the politics around uh, a young man, which I'm assuming was still trying to find himself, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and entering this, this, this realm of, of, of wolves, you know what I'm saying, who have mm -hmm. their own personal interests, but are using your talent, your skills to be able to uh, get their agenda across like how what yeah. would you say reflecting back on that um led you to to really think about like oh okay I, i'm gonna make it and but you have all these wolves around you yeah i mean it is uh, for me you know I, I just had to become basketball real young you know because 
you know, I was playing competitive, you know, national uh, basketball at sixth or seventh grade. So by that time, that kind of like builds a hunger into you and it makes you more competitive in a way. Whereas like now I'm being, I'm not only being ranked in my hood, mm -hmm. now I'm being put in a pool with guys from the city, uh, from the tri-state, now from the country. And, you know, as a competitor, you want to be one of the top ones, you know, amongst those conversations, you know, because, you know, politics is all about a lot of conversation, who they talking about, who's hot now. And then your job as a basketball player is just try to be hot at all the places where people are going to see you. So for me, I kind of like became basketball and it became everything. Like I wasn't going out Friday nights. I wasn't doing regular things that kids in the seventh or eighth grade were doing because I had to be in the gym or my brother had me lifting weights or running steps is because now I had like, I wouldn't say an image to protect, but now it's like, you're considered good. Just don't be the ones that flop. Now you have to stay good and get better and continue to develop. So I think for me, it started at a very young age. Mm, okay. And, and as, as, as far as when you say becoming basketball, um, could you, could you tap, like, what do you mean by that? As far as becoming basketball, just that be basketball being everything that my life revolved around. Like, yeah, okay. like, Looking back on it now, like I wish I would have took school and education a lot more serious than I did. I think I still turned out pretty good, but I feel like I could have dived into more like who I am as a person during that age and more into my brain. But everything just became was like, I have to be a, a better basketball player. I'm ranked, I'm ranked such and such. I have to go up, you know, three notches within the next six months. Like things like that will push you to all you think about is basketball all day. Mm -hmm. So that's when I said, when I became basketball, that's what I meant by it. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, Adri, you, you, you're back. Oh, hold up. I'm going to mute you. Can you hear us? Can you hear us now? I can hear you. All right. Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, perfect. So Adri, uh, can you finish that train of thought you started off with, with the whole, uh, with, with that we're, we're looking at right now, the middle school uh, period. And being a late bloomer, um, what did that entail? You know what I'm saying? Like, what motive, what motivated you to push yourself? I mean, I, I still, like I said at the beginning, like, I'm, in my mind, I'm coming from DR, poor family. Like, basketball, was, it was still fun for me. Even though me being a late bloomer, I'm still looking at basketball. I said, kid, like, I'm just going to go play basketball and stuff like that because I never saw myself not even even going to college, you know, like college came because I used to be on the streets playing the playgrounds, you know, it never in my mind had the, had that mentality that, oh, I'm gonna do this to go to college or raw pro, never. It just started with the love of the game, so. All right, perfect. And uh, with that same train of thought, um. Matt, um, I would, I would, I would consider, uh, let's, let's look at that, uh, middle school Matt, uh, you know, who, who's experiencing certain hardships, who's looking for that motivation. Um, as you look back now and you reflect, what would you say were some integral moments that led to you to pursue being able to write your story, being able to, to, to use, uh, as, as far as in your, in your current book, um, use the story of sports and, and the importance it played in, in the formation? Important to me because it teaches you how to, you know, persevere and how to, you know, have trust in yourself. I know I would, I would, me and my friends would always play sports together and I would walk down to the court even when we were done playing and then just shoot hoops with myself and kind of have time to think and be alone and be alone with my thoughts, kind of shooting hoops alone and, you know, making up games in my mind and putting myself in situations where I was, you know, winning games and kind of running scenarios in my own head. So having that time alone, having that time to think is really kind of what storytellers are doing when they're alone on the page. You're just making up stories and you're kind of running things through your head. So that kind of formation for me with basketball and being alone in my head was something I continue to do as a writer. Mm, okay. And, and, and just to go off that train of thought um, in this, in this conversation, we have uh we had well four on um, Ricky had to go to a, a recruitment um, zoom, uh, but we have three athletes who all come from the same neighborhood um, who all have stories that are, are inspirations to, for, for generations to come. Uh, what would you say are, are good rec recommendations that you give to, to the young, young, like 
uh, well, not young anymore, but to these grown men uh, about being able to share their story and being able to, to put that in, in, in writing? I would say that everyone's story is important. I know I meet a lot of, uh, a lot of young men that are in their 20s and 30s, and they, sit, they always tell me how they wish they could write their stories down. And I tell them, if you write your stories down, then, then you're a writer, and people are interested in reading our stories. I didn't become a, a writer until later in life. It wasn't until I was out of the, out of the military, and I, wasn't, I didn't get started until my 20s. Mm. I found books that were written by, you know, brown people like me. And I didn't really realize that people, you know, our gente were out there writing books. And it was a surprise to me when I started to find writers like Sandra Cisneros and Dagoberto Guild, that I started to realize that, you know, books were for us too. And then yeah. that inspired me to keep writing and to start writing. And I realized that my stories mattered and, you know, my familia mattered and the frontera mattered. And it, that became an important thing for me to start, you know, writing my stories down so I could carry on my family's tradition and my gente's traditions out there. And I think the same thing for Edgar and James and Adris, if they want to write their stories down, that their stories are important. Yeah, perfect. Go out there and look for their own, to look for books that have their voices in there, like Angie Cruz's book. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for those words, uh, Matt. Um, now I want to tap into a bit into James. Um, James is, and, and James is on the, on the, with us a few weeks ago. Um, when, when we discuss, uh, what perseverance and, and, and being, even though you may, you were under the radar, you've been able to accomplish a lot more than, than your peers have you know, um, as far as long, uh, uh, longevity, 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 right. Um, and, and, and perseverance and being able to, to, to maintain a certain level of consistency that a lot of people talk in past terms, you know, Oh, I used to be nice. Oh, I used to do this. Oh, I used to do that. Um, so when we speak on that and, and being able to, to, to reflect now on your high school years, um, could you speak on James in high school? What was the mindset? Um, what were some of the hardships you faced internally? Like, damn, uh, I'm better than this dude, or or I'm, I feel like I'm better than this dude, and I'm not getting the same looks. What is it? And and sometimes the the doubt that that creates in inside of you as an individual. You know what I'm saying? So can yeah. we speak on now the the high school uh, period and and talk about certain insecurities that now as a pro that's uh, basically um uh. I'll, 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 when we speak about longevity, uh, you've been able to maintain a career, a pro career longer than a lot of other individuals um, who were, uh, who would look down on you at, that, at yeah. that particular time period. I mean, in high school, I was never a person to say like how you said, oh, I'm better than this person. I should get these looks. I was always internally just saying, yo, I got to get better. I got to get better. I got to get better. I wasn't too worried about other players. You know, I used to see things. I used to watch games. You know, Edgar went to Rice, and I used to go watch him play. And I never I never felt like, yo, I should be there. I always wanted to get better. I always be like, I'm going to be there one day. Like, I never thought I was better than somebody else. I always thought I had more work to do and more work to put in to get to the level I am now. Like back then, I didn't have the confidence and that killer switch that I have now. There, when I was in high school, I was just a shy, skinny kid, um, just trying to play basketball and have fun. I wasn't like, you know, I, I should be on the radar. I should be ranked in the city. I should be ranked in the country. I was always like, man, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I need to get better. I need, I need to get stronger. I need to do this. I used to see people work out. I used to work out with other people like Edgar and, and see his his work ethic, and it just got me to this level. So I never never talked down on nobody. I still to this day I don't talk down on nobody. So I think that helped me out in the long run and, and helped me, you know, be the person I am today and still be a professional basketball player at this age. Do you feel humility could often go uh, misinterpreted as a as as a weakness? I don't really like. To this day, back then, I don't care what people think about me. I just, yeah. you know, I do it for what I what I love. I, I do what I love and what I want. Um, you know, the few people that know me internally know that I just, 
you know, I, I try to make myself happy and my circle happy. I don't, I don't worry about what other people think and, and all this stuff. So as long as my circle and I'm, I'm living good and, and we, we good, that's, that's all I worry about. Okay. Uh, that, that's cause sometimes what, what I notice when, when, when particularly the, the, the younger kids who are, you know, no, they don't like to talk a lot. They just let the game talk for them. Mm-hmm. You have the, the, El, el Boku, right? El Boku, who's like, bah, bah, bah. and yeah. sometimes, you know, being that these, 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 these young men, right, are so immature at times, um, they let that get to them and alter their game. You know what yeah. I'm saying? They haven't been able to develop that, what I call, um, when people are talking all this noise, right, I, I bought AirPod Pros just to block all of it out. They, they cancel yeah. all the noise, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, sure. um being able to to understand that you were able to develop at that at such a young age, what would you say contributed to, to that being developed? Was there any particular person who, because because at the at times the most important person that we have sometimes is the individual who's motivating us, who's yeah. making sure that the noise around us doesn't necessarily uh 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 disrupt our thought process or 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 what we trying to accomplish you know what i'm saying yeah. is there any any person that you use like what i for what i would call some earpod pros you know what i'm saying my brother um my brother at that age was, was never like yo bro you better than this person um this this and that like of course we all read articles and read the rankings and all that stuff but we just let it come to us like i just i didn't like I, I blocked all that noise out. I was just worried about myself. I wasn't worried about being ranked. Of course, you know, sometimes you like, damn, like I, play, I had a good game and I'll have like four sentences in the newspaper. And, and like I see other players get like a full page article about them. Yeah, sometimes that hurt, but it was just like, I understood like I didn't go to a big high school or, you know, we was in the second division in high school. So I understood that I, I understood at that moment that I was in the headlines and I was cool with it because I always to this day I love being under the radar because I'm not a person to to open my mouth and talk about what I did, what I could do. I got better over time and I feel like that helped me um you know stay how I am now. I, I've been like this all my life and like like I said before, my circle kept me kept me grounded and and of course my family and my friends um they knew what I could do and what I what I was able to do so you know I just listened to them and but they didn't they weren't the people like yo you should be mad you should yeah. use that against them or you should work harder because of that like nah I worked hard because I want to work hard I want to get better you know I want to be a professional basketball player and and support my family all right and um well this one now we 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 go to you Edgar Um, mm-hmm. so, so basically, uh, we want to do the comparison of, of two, well, what I would consider two opposites, right? Um, mm-hmm. you had James who was much more low key. Mm-hmm. Um, you have Adri who was developing his game, right? Um, mm-hmm. and then you have you who you had the hype the whole time, like the whole time along, right? Um, and mm-hmm. understanding the, the noise, right? Because I'm, I'm sure that if individuals were, were encountering noise, yours was a bit amplified just because of that, at, at the level you were at, um, at that particular age, what would you say, who yeah. played the role of being able to filter that out, all that noise out and maintain the, the focus uh, of, yo, you are in route mm-hmm. to be a pro, but there's a lot of pros. Um, and I'm not going to mention names who, who basically um, do what they do. Right. But then, for the rest of their lives and all they could reminisce is on the past and all you hear is well Edgar when I was young yo and you have all these comparisons right mm-hmm. like referencing Instagram live all these lives now mm-hmm. which is like oh let me compare you to this person but you never under like for me for instance when I'm mm-hmm. hearing that is it's not about what if you know what I'm saying um mm-hmm. it's about comparing it hand in hand and not what if this person could have done this because every day I ask myself what if I win the lotto I haven't won it yet you know what I'm saying so um mm-hmm. how, how you block the noise at that age oh uh, that Talk person for me now, high, high yeah school. that person for yeah I would say that that person for me was my brother uh because you know at high school you know I started getting a name around the city but you know at home I was still uh being treated like, you know, the youngest, you know, boy in the family. And 
my brother being someone who played basketball before or someone who, you know, has followed my game would always tell me like, you know, uh, you're, not, you're, you're not that good. Like, I don't care what these people are saying about you. You're not that good. Like, and that will always keep me grounded. That will never let me like, you know, get, get out of line. But then it gets to a point where you are getting a buzz and everywhere you go, people in the city, people know who you are. And at, at every tournament that you play in, people are showing up to watch you and everything like that. So it kind of could get to you a little bit. Then you start thinking that you can figure things out on your own. Even though you're still a young man, you start thinking like, well, you know, if all these people love me, then, you know, I must be that dude. But then it takes for you to, you know, fall on your face or fall on your butt to go back, you know, seeking advice from that person that was there since day one, which was my brother. So I would say the person that kept me in line was definitely my brother. Okay. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and we'll keep, we'll touch into this, but I want to talk to uh, Adri now. Um, uh, Adri, uh, so now we're looking at another polar opposite, right? Um, an individual who started playing a basketball, but his game matured later and was able to, um, through his trajectory, look back and be like, my road wasn't necessarily the conventional route, but I paved my own road brick by brick. You know what I'm saying? So when I think about your story, I think about um, the different tracks that there is no one track to being a pro, right? Uh, the only track that we know leads you to, 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 to being able to make a career out of this is the fact that you put in the required work, right? And that alone is going to determine whether you're fit or you're not. So Adri, understanding that um, while in high school, what were you say? What would you say are some of the moments that you noticed that you were like, "Yo, I'm actually getting better, and I can make a living out of this." I think I've been I've been lucky, I've been blessed to have people around me that saw something in me. Yeah, especially it was Doc Maselli. Is um that, that was my AU coach. Me in high school, I couldn't play high school ball because I didn't go to class. I wasn't focused on classes. I wasn't focused on school. I used to just go to class and be the, like you said, a clown, be the funny guy, you know, uh, with, with the new sneakers, with all the stuff, the new gear. But but talking about basketball, it was just, God took me away from the city and it put me to compete against the top level or uh, athletes all around the world, like going to Vegas, going to, to Maryland. And me saw myself competing against this guy when I came back to my neighborhood. That's when I saw my game improving, you know? And that's when I was like, you know what? And I took it serious. Even though I knew basketball without, without going to school was never going to work. And Doc always used to tell me like, listen, if you really want to take this serious, you need to go to class because you cannot play basketball and not go to class. It's not going to work out. And that's little by little, I, I, I didn't understand it right away. And so I, I started playing and, and saw something coming from it, from basketball by playing it. And I took a GD and did what I did in fellowship. So. Yeah, so so back on that on that track, Adri, because I also don't, uh, there's a lot of individuals that like to romanticize this uh, I didn't go to school track. You know what I'm saying? Can you speak on the importance of being able to get an earlier start by focusing earlier and you won't have to necessarily face these hardships because all of a sudden you want to be too school for school. You want to be too cool for school. But what that's doing is, is technically prolonging your start. You know what I'm saying? Can you speak on that and, and the importance of, of taking school serious at a younger, at a younger age? Of course, of course. Like you going to class and do doing all your stuff, and and being dedicated to the game of basketball. If you really want to uh, be a student athlete, you need to go to go to school. No matter, I, I I was blessed enough that I didn't go to class and still made it because my dedication to the love for the game. But I got lucky, to tell the truth. I really got lucky because me doing that, I had all the people that was helping me with this, but. If you do the right thing, like Edgar did, like um, James did, like they went to school, they knew what they wanted, like that is it get easier for you, you know? The route gets shorter. Look, I start, I turned a pro when I was 24, you know? You're supposed to be a pro when you turn 24, get out of school and or 20 or 23. I I become a pro late, late in my 
later on um, being um, older. So so I feel like you going to school early, focus on the little things if you really want to be a student athlete, you know? But uh, yeah. school is the main thing. You're not going to cheat the game by, by oh, I'm not going to class this day because I'm good enough in basketball. No. At one point of, uh, of your career, it's going to hunt you. Yeah. Yeah, so, thanks. Yeah. Oh, and, and and I see I see the the AirPods. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I guess yo, that. Matt. Um, this is this is going towards your to towards you, Matt, because like I know you're seeing this from a different lens, right? Um, these are all individuals who 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 took different uh, routes, but ended up making a living out of professional basketball, right? Um, understanding that these are avenues that some of your readers uh, could take. Um, what would you say um, are key uh, characteristics that every human being needs to have, regardless of uh, if they're using sports as a vehicle, school as a vehicle, or or any other, let's say, um, and uh, some uh, any other uh, career? Well, I, so I had a very similar experience, like at three when I was in in school. I was also, you know, a class clown didn't pay attention too much. And I kind of squandered my high school education too. I wasn't a great student, but unlike Adri, I didn't have basketball as a, as an outlet. I wasn't going to go pro in basketball. Like one of the characters in Barely Missing Everything, I was, you know, an average player. You know, I was a six man on the bench. I come out, I would goon it up, collect some fouls, give people a spell. And then that was basically it. I wasn't going to get a scholarship. I wasn't going to go pro, even though I loved the game. And then I realized that I didn't have scholarships waiting for me. Grade-wise, that was definitely not going to happen because, you know, I would get C's, D's, and F's. And so school, I had really wasted school. So me wanting to pursue a profession, I realized as I got close to graduation that I was going to have to get serious about other things. And I made my future really difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think as you become a senior, you realize if you've messed around in school and you don't have something that you're going to be really fantastic at afterward or fantastic at afterwards, that you're going to have to really scramble and become a pro at something later in life. And that's a, that's a hard choice to make. So I think young people need to kind of focus on, on their, their education. And I became a pro as a writer much later in life. I graduated college. I have my master's degree, but I didn't do all that stuff until my late thirties. And I had to work full time through school as when I was getting my undergraduate and my graduate degree, I was working full time at the same time. I have a wife, kids, and it was just a long, long grind to do it. My first book came out and I was already in my mid thirties. And when my novel came out last year, I was already 42. So like Adri, who became a pro later in life, I became a pro much later in life. And it wouldn't have had to be that way if I had paid attention in school. Yeah. Now, not being the greatest student in the earth isn't the end of the road. So I always tell kids when I go and speak to them in high schools that just because you weren't the greatest student doesn't mean that your future is already lost. It just means you're going to have to grind much harder. So I think that's what, uh, you know, Edgar, Adri, and James know from their career paths is that you have to put the work in. You have to get up and you have to stay in shape. I heard Adri say earlier, it only takes two two days to get out of shape. And I think that's the same for for most people who are pros at things. And if you don't stick to what your what your uh, job is, what you're professional at, if you if you let yourself slip and somebody else is waiting there to take your job. Yeah. And, you know, you have to stay sharp at what you're doing. You have to stay focused. You have to love it. You have to stay dedicated. And I think when you're a pro at something, you you have that desire to keep doing it. Thank you. Um, Edgar, uh, this one. So we're looking at now we're looking at high school years, uh, making all this noise. You have a, a, a decision to make. Um, I would say junior years, usually when, when college starts becoming this, uh, this thing, right. Where it's like, now I have to start considering what my next step is. Right. What would you say, when did the college talks begin? Um, and when did you start getting heavily recruited, um, to start making a decision? And once you made the decision, what were some of the, what was some of the thought process behind it? Um, so I started realizing like probably by the end of my freshman year that, that college was a possibility. You know, I started getting uh, recruitment letters and all this stuff. And then uh, my sophomore year, I started getting invited to all these national camps where, 
ABCD and Nike All American camp where you have like the best 50 or 60 players in the country uh, meet up in, in for one big camp. So once I started getting that, I knew that maybe you know I could go to college. And for me, my my process was easy, but 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 now that I look back on it, I would have done it different. My process was easy because I was looking up to someone. But to this day, you know, Francisco Garcia is, you know, he's like a basketball god to me. And he was at the University of Louisville. So once I got that offer from Louisville, it was like, there's no chance. You have a, a Dominican kid from the, you know, NYC area who looks like me, comes from where I come. We have the same ethnic background and he's made it. So... I want to be just like him. I want to make it. I want to uh, save my family and, and help us live better. So I try to kind of follow his his roadmap to success. And now looking back on it, being an older man, I feel like, you know, only you know what's best for you. Only you know the route that you want to take and the life that you want to live. Sometimes, you know, what worked for someone doesn't necessarily work for you. So if I can do it over again, I will still go to the University of Louisville. I will still play for Rick Pitino. I loved it. But I wouldn't so much look up to someone so hard in that way that I did everything that they did because maybe things would have turned out different if I probably would have gone my own route, you know? That's that's deep right there. Um I'm I'm gonna ask some of the probing questions to that. Um mm-hmm. so let's let's look at let's look at um being able to create your own path, right? And and mm-hmm. looking up to individuals because um, I agree with what you said. To, to a certain extent, um, every individual should have the ability to be able to um, set their own, like set their own path, mm-hmm. but with the understanding that there are individuals who are um, ahead of us who have, mm-hmm. might have taken a similar path, but that right. doesn't necessarily mean that we have to follow the path Same as exactly. if we're going right behind them. Because sometimes circumstances are different. Uh, exactly. What you see might not necessarily be the reality of the situation. You're just seeing how it's filtered out through this person's lens, right? Which right. might not necessarily be something you agree with. Um, exactly. so with that said, right, um, how do you feel um, when, let's say, for instance, I look up to Edgar Sosa, he went to Louisville, he wore number four, um, mm-hmm. and he did all these moves, because you have individuals now following you, particularly right. young, uh, student athletes. What suggestions yeah. do you have for them who are just literally mm-hmm. saying, Edgar Sosa is my idol. I look up to him and I'm doing yeah. everything he's doing. Yeah, well, I actually, I get that a lot from younger guys in the neighborhood and in New York. And, you know, they always tell me, you know, I look up to you, man. You know, since I was a little kid and all this stuff, I want to do exactly what you've done and, and, and the person you've become. And I give the same answer to all of them. I tell them, you could, you could become better than me. You could do what I've done times 10. Um, just because I think uh, what I've done, what James has done, what Adri has done, it resonates with them just because they're from that area. They come from where we come from, they seen what we seen, and now they kind of see us as these like figures that represent success. And success could be everything. They don't have to be basketball players. They don't have to be athletes. You could become successful like Matt is. You know, there's different roles to success. So. When kids ask me for advice, I tell them, you can be successful, but it doesn't automatically have to be through a sport. You can be successes everywhere. You just have to find what you're good at and attack it. All right, thanks, thanks. And now, James, we're gonna we're gonna go over to you. Um, and this still remains fresh in my mind because we have a, had a pretty deep conversation um, around those high school years, uh, getting one offer um, and not necessarily being discouraged, right? Um, so you're, you're the story of now, all right. Um, I did my thing. I played ball. I I put up my numbers, but how come, uh, you flew under the radar. Right. And not, and, and you got like, there was a lot of people in your class who went to schools that I was like, what? Like, these are D2 players. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, um, understanding that using that as motivation, what would you say was one uh, one key moment in high school when you said, I right, one offer, I'm going to kill everybody? Like I said before, I never had that I'm going to kill everybody. If I did, I had it inside. I never really said it out loud. Um, but like, like you said, I mean, I was under the radar, so I was just always hungry. You know, I was always 
I was happy when I got my first offer. I'm like, All right, I'm going to school for free because I saw my mother put in the work and work every day from nine to six just to pay my just to pay uh, school for my brother to go to college. And I'm just like, yo, I don't want that for my moms. You know, I, I want to go to school for free. And of course, I was a little mad and, and down about only receiving one offer. Um, but as soon as that happened, you know, I was just like, All right, I'm just going to go there and just and just grind and just try to get better. Um, try to make my own path and my own name. Um, I just, I knew, I knew I wasn't at that time. I was like, I'm not going to be a professional basketball. So I'm like, I'm just happy with going, going to school for free and getting a free education. And I wasn't the smartest kid. You know, I was, I was, I was always in and out of class, not going to class. Um, but then my freshman year, you know, I got into trouble. So um, that and I, I sat down with a few people in my circle and they were just like, yo, you got to focus. You know, if, if you don't want to play basketball, it's OK, but you got to focus on school and, and just finish these four years. And and then you decide what you're going to do the rest of your life. And when that happened, I'm just like, man, I don't want to you know, what I mean, I don't want to have a nine to five. But I kind of want to play basketball the rest of my life, not the rest of my life, but for a long time. So that's that's when it just put the fire under me. I was just like, yo, I got to I got to get better. I got to get better. I, I have a chance. You know, but um, it, it took me some time and, and I'm just happy that, that I found that that passion. So so I would be do you feel like I would be correct to say that um, adversity was your fuel, not necessarily the competitor, but being able to, to face the adversity led you to say uh, now there is uh, I have to step up to meet the challenge, you know, yeah, for um, sure. and not necessarily the individual that you would be competing against. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's what my adversity I had my freshman year. And, you know, I just, I just sat down and it was just like, man, like, I just want to finish school. Um, and one thing that's going to help me finish school is if I focus on basketball more. Yeah. And, you know, basketball in school was, it was always one and two, you know, I always wanted to play basketball and go to school second, but, you know, then it became like one and one, one A, one B. So uh, I kept on going to classes and stuff and, and, and focus on being a different person, a different human being. Yeah. Let's um, go back that, a little that... bit though, James, not, not, not college, not yet. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I see that you, you, you reference your mother a lot when it comes to um, a lot of your successes. Right. Uh, yeah. Now let, let's, let's take a look at the role that maybe, you know, there's households, there's kids that probably don't have the mother, the father, the aunt, the auntie, you know what I'm saying? Or the uncle. They probably have a guardian who, or an advisor who's, who's really looking out uh, for them and providing them with, with, with a certain advice. What were you say were, were some key um, contributions that your mother did towards you besides the, the financial and the putting you in these schools, but just being there as a mother um, and, and, and being able to, what were some of the challenges that you say that you, that you would say led you to be like, um, no de carrialte, como yo dicen, not, not suevo and potentially get lost to, 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 to the, the street cycle. You heard it, James? You froze? You hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you now. So, you know, growing up in Washington Heights is always that, that, that path that you can go with the down yeah. path of, you know, being in the street, you know, seeing things you're not supposed to see, doing things you're not supposed to do. Uh, my mother and my brother didn't let me do that. You know, I was, I had a curfew. Um, I couldn't go outside. You know, it was, it was basketball court, my friend's house or, or I'm home. Um, so it, it was that, it was that she was strict. You know, it was, it was, you're not doing nothing else. Like you, you're going to stay home. And of course, I had moments of not listening and getting in trouble and going outside and, and doing stuff that I was not supposed to do. But I just feel like there's always somebody in your life that you feel like that is just nagging you, but they, they just know what's what's best and they, they trying to look out for you. But at that time, sometimes you might not think like like you'd be like, oh, she just she just talking. She just wants to be strict, you know, but. I always had that times. I always got into it with my mom and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, I think that helped me in the long run. Oh, okay. Um, so this, this one's going to you, Adri. Um, uh, same question I asked James. Uh, what role do, what role, uh, what role do you feel your family played? Um, like since you were a little bit, uh, you bloomed a little late. Um, I'm a little, cause I know your mother and your, your family. 
but what role do you feel like your mother played when it came to um, seeing that you have all this potential, but you're not necessarily uh, using it properly? I mean, my not my mom, even my dad. My dad is a guy that really worked hard and like since we was a kid in DR. He used to have like three jobs, seen us at three in the morning, wake us up to give us a kiss. When he decided to come to the United States, did the same thing, got us to the United States. And my mom, me being a, a family kid, even though I wasn't doing the right thing as a student athlete and wasn't going to class and doing all the stuff that I needed to do, but still my family is really strong. We, we stay together, you know? And they, it, it, it's a big part because as a kid in high school, I used to be in gangs. I used to do bad things. But I always remind me every time I'm doing something wrong that I'm not supposed to be doing, it's like how my mom is going to look at me, how my dad is going to look at me. And I always had that stuff in my mind, like, like okay, um, I'm doing this stuff with my friends, trying to be cool. And now when I get home, if I get called, then it's going to be a problem. And that's what happened. Like, like, like I said, like when I got locked up, when I got locked up with my friends, the things that I go through my mind was as if I was going to go to jail for five years, six years, or whatever it was. The whole thing that was in my mind was like, yo, my dad and my mom is going to kill me. Like, even though I'm doing this bad stuff, my mom is really going to kill me. Like, and me saw my mom at the judge and looking at the judge crying. That's when I decided really to take basketball serious. That was my, my, my way. I was like, it's, like, I had this talent that God gave me and I worked hard. So I think I, I never want to see my mom like that again. You know, you just I just took over from there. Thanks, Adri. Um, Matt, um, so this question's for you, right? Uh, you said you grew up in El Paso, which I'm assuming is a little bit more rural, uh, a rural community, right? Um, now, in, in comparison to that inner city living, what would you say uh, would be some of the challenges or some of the distractions that you faced uh, growing up that could have potentially led you uh, to not be able to, even though you uh, you 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 said you you bloomed late, you still had the ability to not be um, shackled down or 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 restrained by the system, and and it and it, it didn't allow you to flourish. You know, like uh, what would you say in comparison to some of the stories that you're hearing from individuals who lived in the inner city? What were some of the challenges you faced in the rural areas? No. Uh, Paso is not really that uh, rural. It's it's okay. pretty urban, at least the part I grew up in. Okay. So it's it's just kind of sprawling out. It's kind of set up the way like uh, I would say California set up as oh. far as uh, the, the West is. So it's still it's still pretty urban. I was in an, an in an older neighborhood. You know, it's kind of like you know falling apart buildings and buses and everything. So it was it's a pretty urban environment. It's not it's not as big a city as you know as yeah. New York or Chicago, but it's it's. Uh, it's not like a rural kind of farm matter. Anymore. Okay. It's just real deserty. Yeah. Okay. So what would you say were, were, were uh, growing up in that environment, what would you say were some of the challenges that could have potentially, potentially led you to become a statistic or part of the cycle? Well, I think it's a lot of the same challenges that, that uh, you know, Edgar James and Adri faced. You know, both my parents worked full-time jobs, so they weren't home. So I was, you know, one of those kids that even at six years old was walking to school by himself, going to kindergarten, walking alone, had an older brother or an older sister and a younger brother. And we were alone a lot of the times, fending for ourselves, cooking our own food, watching out for ourselves. And, you know, that's growing up poor that's just kind of how the way it is sometimes there's not enough food in the house you don't have a lot of of new clothes or clothes at all shoes that don't fit you you're out in the street with your friends running around doing you know being a travieso doing you know yeah. what you feel like doing and there's just not a lot of people around you, mm -hmm. and, you know, what would you say led you well um an instance where you were uh you had your back against the wall and you had to make a decision like yo if i go this route for sure, you know what's going to happen if you go on that route. Um, there's endless possibilities. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of those instances. I mm -hmm. remember once me and my friends were walking down the street, and there was this guy who used to be like a really close friend of ours, and then he decided that he was going to join one of the one of the gangs that was in the neighborhood. And me and my other friend, we didn't join that gang, and then he ended up, you know, getting hooked on coke and other drugs, and he saw us there and. He was asking us what we were doing there and like, yo, man, we've lived here our whole life just like you. He's like, well, you don't walk down here anymore. And he pulled a gun out on us and he just started blasting at us. We ducked yeah. and just kind of ran away. 
you know, we dodged through all the neighborhoods and alleys and we ended up back at my friend's grandfather's house and we watched the ghetto bird fly over all the cops come. And, you know, afterwards, you know, nothing happened. Like nobody went to jail and we just kind of went on with life. And afterwards like, man, we got to get out of here. Yeah. Cause we would have been shot. Nobody would have cared. And, you know, it seemed like nobody cared no matter what would have happened. Cause I've seen people get shot. We go to the funeral, then we would just move on and like nothing would happen. Yeah. So afterwards we were thinking, man, this is crazy. We got to do something. We got to get out of here. It's the yeah. one problem me and my friends were having. It's like, we can't live like this. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah. Ed, uh, Edgar. So um, now we, we, we're starting to look at college, right? But one thing I wanted to, 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 to bring back and, and, and see, uh, see your thought behind this. When we talk about intergenerational, right? Um, uh, the, the ability that older individuals have this influence over us sometimes that lead us to, to follow paths that I wouldn't say weren't necessarily meant for us, mm -hmm. but um, uh, I wouldn't say that they weren't meant for us, but I would say that they're not necessarily our path, if you know what I'm saying, because that's the hint I was getting when you were speaking. Right. Um, right. It, it's not that it wasn't meant for me, but I just feel like um, sometimes... Uh, when you when you go blindly into a situation that you assume you understand what's going on, sometimes you get these little hiccups that you could have prevented if you understood things a little bit better, right? Um, so with that, for said, sure. Uh, when when we speak about intergenerational uh, building these intergenerational bridges, meaning you have an individual like Francisco Garcia who's in his twenties, uh, you have an individual who's up and coming who's fourteen, fifteen. Uh, 16 years old uh, looks up to you um, what role do you feel uh, somebody in that position should have when it comes to mentoring somebody who's up and coming I think uh, you have the just the, the the responsibility just to be there just because um, you're you you have already went through everything that person is going to go through you understand so it's like you know when you first go through something it's brand new to you you don't know the good parts that are coming. You don't know the bad parts that are coming. But if you have someone who's kind of like following in your footsteps, you could kind of gauge what to try to keep them away from and the things that they should be doing in order to have, you know, the clearest way possible to success. So I feel like your, responsi your responsibility as an older person to someone who's looking out, uh, looking up to you is just to be there, just to be there and just try to, you know, try to just lead them in the right path the best way you can. Um, and, and on that note, Edgar, um, as far as responsibility, right, um, do you feel that when you were coming up, there was individuals that you look up to that had, that you felt demonstrated that responsibility towards you? Yeah, I mean, Francisco okay. uh, has done it and, and he still uh, does it to this day. You know, there's, I think there's sometimes that, you know, as the older person, uh, you can't kind of <laughs> You have to know like kind of when to speak and kind of like when to let that younger person just go through what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And I think he's done a he's done a great job of that. And then it's now now it turns into something that is past basketball because his career is not over. It's now over. Mine's is will be in the next four or five years. So it's kind of like now he's teaching me about life and business and and having a family and things like that. So those are things that I could be on the lookout for as I'm getting older. Yeah, so um, life beyond basketball, and we'll touch into that uh, after, after uh, towards the end. Um, but uh, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask James a question now. I'm gonna ask James the same question. Um, uh, James, because uh, because my 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 as somebody who does youth programming, uh, particularly in Washington Heights, we get kids from Dykeman, the Bronx, Connecticut, New Jersey, the Bronx. You know, um, sometimes there's there's this gap that 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 you see, and it's not because of the individual youth worker or the person running the programs, but it's also of the athlete or the individual coming back and being able to be a reference point for a lot of these youths. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Where it's like, it's not about me as somebody who runs a program anymore, but them visually being able to visualize um, the possibilities, you know? My possibility is a bit different from theirs because I'm not an athlete. You know what I'm saying. So sometimes is is tough because uh, I like I like 
I like playing my lane, right? When it's like, um, and I, and I want to commend you, James, for it, because with James, I'm always sending him texts with group te- uh, groups. Like, yo, James, yo, there's this youth that 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 does these bas- like wants to talk basketball. I'm not here to talk to you about basketball. I'm more uh, of a life person and and being able to to to, to develop a, a a structured path where you minimize not only liabilities. But you also start to contemplate, damn, there, there's possibilities. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah. James, let's speak on uh, mentorship. Did, w- was it available to you? Um, and uh, did you have, and, and we're talking now about pro athletes only, right? We're talking about an individual who mm-hmm. was accomplished, said, James, you know what? Um, let, let's, let's develop this mentorship relationship. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have any, um, that was a professional basketball player. I had, uh, I had a couple mentors that were successful in, in life and in, in yeah. doing other things. So it wasn't, I really didn't, you know, I looked up to a lot of people like Ricky Greer um, and his brother, they lived up the block from me while I was growing up, but I knew it was difficult for them because, you know, they were overseas all the time. And my brother, you kept in contact with them and, you know, we talked a few times, but it wasn't so much like, yo, let's sit down and talk about life and talk about basketball. Um, so like I said, I, I had other people um, that wasn't really too worried about me being a prof- professional basketball player. Mm-hmm. It was just trying, they were trying to make me succeed in life, exactly. which I'm trying to do now um, with your help, of course, um, and, and my college coach. And, you know, I, I talked to a lot of kids that's in college now and you know, just trying to help them with that. It's not so much like people want to, like I just said, people want to be like somebody else. I feel like you have your own path and I'm a perfect example of that. Adri is definitely a perfect example of that. So it's just like pick your path and just try to just try to be you. You know, it's just like don't try to follow people footsteps. You know, I, I understand nowadays, you know, with social media and stuff like that. But I'm I'm so big into be you like. Be, be, become the person you are like mess up like do him, have a mistake like Adri had and look what he did after that it, it, it got him to rock bottom to now he's on top you know so I think that's that's what I'm, I'm preaching about now like talking to the youth yeah so so and I, and I say that to, to, to say this right um what what, what 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 I'm noticing now is there's a lot of what I call poses all these actors, all these clowns, they were always around, you know what I'm saying? But being that when you accomplish something in life, it's not necessarily to be where you were at, but you do become this sort of, and I don't want, I I don't like developing savior complexes, but I think going back to what Edgar said, you have this responsibility of being able to, I don't, I don't have to engage with you every single day, but yeah. there's going to be times when I'm in a crossroad and I'm so confused that your advice might be the difference between I hit a I hit a dead end or yeah. I hit so many different possibilities. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So um, with that said, and 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 that, and I basically asked this question not to create no cheese, but there's a big deficiency in Washington Heights where you have yo Washington Heights. If we we could create a list, we have a lot of pro players. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the reason why, and one of the main reasons why um, I developed this platform is, is because it's not solely your responsibility to come back to the hood. There has to be infrastructures where you don't necessarily have to build it, where you could just say, yo, um, I got some time for two hours next week. I'm in there. All right, cool. Boop, boop. Everything's yeah. organized. You're in and you're out. Because as we notice, life has certain responsibilities that your career is not over yet. And even yeah. when it is over, you might enter some endeavors that's still time consuming. So it's yeah. like, it's not necessarily that I want to say, no, I, I, I can't do it. But life as it works is there's different priorities and there's a schedule we have to follow, right? Yeah. Um, even even doing this, right? There's already seven, seven missed calls because we have like this food distribution thing going on tomorrow, right? So... Um, and I say that to, 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 to not minimize because time is very important, is of the essence. But a lot of individuals automatically assume that just because you're a pro, you also have to put in the time to develop these organizations to be yeah. able to talk for yourself. You yeah. know, um, and like I said, um, and, and James has been uh, very present at all times. Edgar, whenever you're here, you, 
but we have a platform here where we have youth that need the support that need yeah. the connection. And I, I brought Matthew on board because Matthew is another example of the way that you uh, communicate and, and the way that you are, are perceived to be a pro doesn't necessarily only have to be the basketball route. For it sure. could be about, oh, I, I could be a, a Popovich or I could be a, a, a writer and, yeah. and still um, demonstrate that love for the game without necessarily having to be too caught up in it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and I said that to say this. Now, James, if we're starting it off with you, let's mm -hmm. talk about college. Um, <laughs> I know you spoke about uh, the difficulties uh, when you first got there. We understand the hurdles, right? We understand that at this point, you've been able to de develop these, what I would say, um, uh, this, this, this character that's not going to let any sort of adversity deter you from your goal, which is, yeah. I should, uh, I was about to, uh, pardon the French, <laughs> things got difficult. Yeah. Now I had to put in the work two years later. Let's talk about James junior year. I mean, like you, like, like I said before, um, you know, I, I hit rock bottom my freshman year. Um, you know, I got into some trouble. So um, I, I feel like that helped me get back to, to being me. You know, it, it was like, if, if I hit this rock bottom, I, I got to, the only way I'm going to stay in this school if if I'm playing basketball. So I can't get kicked off the team. So I got to get better. So I just put in the work. I just put in that extra work. Um, and then in two years, like you say, you know, from my junior year, I was I was a starting shooting guard for my, for my school. Um, and, you know, I was playing over 30 minutes. And even then I was like, damn, I, two years ago, I would, I would never thought I was doing this. Um, but there was just, it was just a lot of hard work, a lot of extra time. Um, a lot of people in my corner, like I always thank my college coach and my assistant coach. Um, they put that, like that dog in me that, that just made me want to work and, and get better. Mm. And how many, how many points you scored those last two years, James? <laughs> I scored. Uh, it's a competitive sport, man. You gotta. You I gotta. mean, in three years, I scored over thirteen hundred points. Okay, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. cause, cause there was a post that I did earlier. Cause there's a lot of chitter going on. You got like these youngins. Um, I'm not gonna mention the, the the Georgia Tech point, but it's like men lie, women lie, numbers don't. You know what I'm but saying? But that's something. Sometimes. That's something. That's something we like. I mean, personally. I don't yeah. listen. Yeah. I don't. You know me. I don't. Do, I don't think about it. I don't read it. Yeah, they, but, they want to talk at school. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. Um, so Matt, um, in in the same essence, right? Uh, um, what would you say? Uh, you 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 consider yourself a late bloomer. Um, what right. would you say is is extremely important to for the youth to know that even though through mistakes, even though through uh, difficult times, even though through um, you feel that, that, that your path is, has taken longer than you expected. Um, there's still a light at the end of the road. Um, and sometimes, uh, being able to work out, work through things. So we could talk about what are some of the, the, the instances when you were getting your bachelor's and your master's that really motivated you to keep going. Well, for me, it was finally understanding as I was growing up that I get to define who I am. I think when I was growing up, I got the stigma on me that I was uh, not a smart kid. I wasn't in the gifted and talented programs. I got bad grades and I, there was a few teachers that, you know, if you go to public school, you're going to have some bad teachers in there and they kind of, you know, stick the label on you. You know, you're a troublemaking kid, you're a bad kid or you're a stupid kid. And that kind of, when you're, when you're young, you kind of internalize a lot of that, a lot of those uh, labels on you. So I went through school thinking that I was, you know, not a good student and that I hated school. I didn't really realize until I got to college and I was, you know, older. I was in my mid twenties when I started that I actually enjoyed, you know, reading, reading books, reading history and writing down my thoughts on paper. And I started to get really into it. And I decided I, it, it, it occurred to me that I get to decide who I am and what I like without having, you know, some adults, a perception of me put on me mm. and it was kind of so I started to bloom then as a student you know as an adult realizing that I get to decide who I'm going to be mm. and that and, to me that was a real turning point I took control mm. of my own education and then my own identity as an adult and then I started just doing the work and mm -hmm. loving school and then loving who I was turning into mm. dope deep um, so, uh, and, and, and an interesting fact for everybody here, 
So how I came across uh, Matthew's book, uh, Matt, Matt's book was uh, we had an event, um, a Zoom, which Angie Cruz, who's the author of, of, of a very uh, like a top selling book right now called Dominicanas. Wonderful. She, she did an event with these youth um, and they basically selected uh, Matt's book. So Angie tells me, hey, Domingo, you should you should hit up like let me hit up Matt. <laughs> And then the first thing Matt does is, yo, there's a hundred books for the kids. Boom. You know what I'm saying? So, so uh, appreciate it, Matt. Uh, thank no you for problem. that. Um, Absolutely. Now back to some basketball talk, right? Um, so Edgar, um, let's talk about uh, friendships, right? We're not, we're not going to get to college just yet. Let's talk about the importance of friendships um, and, and sometimes how having the right people around you is the difference between uh, passing or failing. You know what I'm saying? And by that, I mean in life. Like, oh, um, you got the hype. You got all the girls, because with the hype comes all the girls, right? You have the ability to be like, yo, you know what? <laughs> it, you, at that time, it wasn't even Google me, right? It was more like, um, it was more like, uh, what, look out for the newspaper. Look at that column. Um, I, got a, I, got a, I, got a, I got a little uh, paper out there, right? You and James are best friends, right? How important is it to have a friend who's as hungry as you, who is as determined as you, and is adding and not subtracting from your life? Wait, wait, you're muted. Hold up, let me unmute you. Hold up. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, having James as my best friend is just, it's been crazy because it's someone who aspires uh, just like you do, who dream just like you do, who want to have the things that you want to have. And then on top of that, he's like by your side pushing you in order uh, to get you to that level. And like having someone just Hold like yeah. to be way is that just that that all cut off, if it's a, a relationship that you have to force. What you just, everything you just said just yeah. cut off. Can you hear me now? Yeah, what did yeah. you what did you hear? Um when when uh pushing you and by your side and then everything just went downhill after. Yeah. Yeah, so just having a, a friend like James who pushes you and, and, and is by your side is something important because at the end of it all, you're gonna do what your friends are doing. And if your friend is doing the same thing and he aspires to be what you wanna be, and you guys have goals and you have timetables set of when you wanna reach those goals, it's kinda like it's easy to keep your life on track because because you have someone who you see every day, who you spend a lot of time with, who is fighting for his dream as well. So you know that if you slack off, he's going to he's gonna outbeat you. And if he slacks off, I'm going to outbeat him. So it's kind of like a friendly and a brotherly love, you know, kind of like competitiveness that we have with each other on, on just being successful. Mm. You know, we know that basketball is not going to last forever. We know that him playing well is not going to take away from me. I know that that me playing well is not going to take away from him. So we we is we, we support each other with, with love because we know uh, how hard the other works and, and, and what we want to be in the future. Um, how, how, how are you able because I know like especially a lot of the youth that we're working with, sometimes it's difficult to differentiate. Mm -hmm. And, and, to, and, to, and to not show love to the individual you came up with, but sometimes you're, you're, you're embarking in this path where you might have to do it alone because nobody, like that person is not adding anything. If anything, he's just um, either one, leeching, right? You're trying to tap into the, to the norm. Mm -hmm. Or two, he, they just around and just don't know what to do because they themselves are, uh, 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 are not self-motivated enough. You know what I'm saying? So what would yeah. you say... Um, is the synergy that you and James developed that eventually led to that. You know what I mean? So it's like, I right, cool. We're growing up. We coming up. Um, mm -hmm. cause another thing that we got to note is you from Dykeman, James from the Heights. There's always that little yeah. situation going on between the, Oh, you from this hood, right. I'm from that hood. Um, what would you say, uh, develop that synergy now where you're both of y'all like, yo, we at the same, at the same page, but also, we both mutually pushing each other. It's not, oh, I'm pushing you, and you're just looking at me like, huh? you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. To be to be in that space is just is just great. And the way things came about is kind of like I met James at a Warriors practice, and all of a sudden 
his best friend in the, in the seventh grade gets transferred to my middle school and we become best friends. And how do you know James? And then that's how, how, how it all started, being that he's from the Heights and I'm from Dykeman. <laughs> but now as the friendship grows and we're at this level, it's kind of like, bro, like I genuinely from my heart want to see you do great and be good and take care of your family and not have no stresses. And then when you have two friends who sincerely and genuinely feel that way about another, it's like, it's, it's hard to let up and, and it's so easy to keep going because you know you have somebody there that's pushing you. Mm, that's dope. And James, um, I'm gonna ask you the same question before I, I tap in Adris. Um, what would you say uh, as young uh, student athletes who are coming up, um, what type of synergy should do you have to develop with your friends so that the relationship is, we're both adding to each other instead of taking away? I mean, that's just something that over time, you know, you you develop, um, you notice, you know, it's always going to be when you're younger, you know, you just hang around with your friends and stuff. But like he said, you know, we, we had a group of guys that just wasn't too worried about how we played or, or leeching on, like you say, it was just a true friendship, even at, at seventh, eighth grade, you know, so it was just just we just want to we just want to do good and, and make sure everybody was doing well and on the right path. When you say a true friendship, um, how, how do you define a true friendship? Somebody that pushes you. Uh, and then I even, like, it's off the court. It's with me and him, it's just more off the court now. Of course, we we grown. It, when we was growing up, it was always on the court. And, and, you know, we had the same goals and we wanted the same things. And we know how to get it. But I feel like it was just off the court. Because, like, when I, when, I'm, when I was messing up, he was the first one to call me or, or put me back on the right path or if he did something wrong I was the first one to call him and so it was just it was just that friendship and you uh, over time when you get older you realize what friendship it really is mm. and now um I'm gonna get back I'm gonna get back to uh, we're gonna start talking about the pros but I uh, missed a few questions so I uh, we're talking now about um and Edgar you're next when it comes to the college question um uh, uh you got your GED uh you go to Globe you go to Idaho and then you land in Eastern Washington. Uh, can you talk to us about the experience of, of being able to transition from uh, street ball to playing uh, college basketball? Um, yeah, my journey was, it was hard, but fun at the same time. Because like I told you at the beginning, like the love for the game, I didn't see it like, oh, I need to go to high school. I need to, do, even though I'm, I was supposed to. Yeah. But when I got my GD, I got my GD by playing in street ball. Uh, yeah. a, a coach came down, watched me play. First, I went to California playing one year, and um, and did great. After that, transferred to Southern Idaho, and that's when I really, really saw basketball. I took it serious, wow. you know, because before all, all of that, like y'all talking about friendship, I was blessed enough to have a group of guys or my friends, mm -hmm. even though. They was doing the bad things, mm -hmm. they was selling drugs. They was doing this, but they saw in me something that they always used to protect me. Mm -hmm. When I got cut up, that I went to jail with my friends, and the judge made me choose between going to going to a program or go to school, and got my scholarship, and I decided to move on. My friends never try to take me off that path. Mm. even though when they doing bad things and I jump at their car, they be like, no, get out, go to another car. Like that's the little things that I really appreciate about my friends. Even mm. though you brought up James and Edgar about that friendship, but mm. going back to college, like, wait, wait, let's, let's, let's go back. Let's, 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 let's hit that. Right. Um, so, so you're in a, in an interesting situation, right. Where, uh, a lot of illicit activities, um, and you have friends who are engaging in, in, in situations that could potentially be uh, either life ending or or you could be uh, it, you could be frozen. This is what I call jail. You could be frozen for X amount of years. Right. Um, yeah. What would you say? Right. Understanding that these type of situations were going on, you've already been arrested. What would you say um, besides the fact your parent, the the how you felt uh, about your mother in the situation and your family. Um, what roles do you feel like your friends played in being able to be like, yo, you know what, too hard? Um, this is not it right now. And, and you need to stay away. Like, what, 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 what did that look like? 
I mean, uh, they play a big role because even though if I start from, from the beginning mm -hmm. and they tell me you want to start your whole basketball career, everything, I wouldn't change anything because it got it, it made me who I am, mm -hmm. you know. And and my friend played a big role because even though they was doing we was doing bad stuff, and I was involved with them because they was my close friend, they never tried to get me like I said out of my path mm. because they felt like me doing great, they was doing great, you know, mm. because they was in the same situation that I was in. I wasn't that good. They wasn't that good. There was most of them used to be. More, better than me as playing basketball, but they never took that path and I took it. So all my success that I did doing well, the days, okay. years, I'm sorry, they really, they really, really enjoyed it, you know, and that's, and mm -hmm. I was blessed, blessed by that. So, mm. But now let, let's fast track, right? Um, so you have a crossroad and that crossroad leads you to, um, cause I remember you, you got, you, it was first globe, then you went to California, then you yeah. went to Southern Idaho, and then you went to um, uh, Eastern West Washington. Eastern Eastern Washington, Washington, right? Yeah. Um, you had that opportunity now where it was like, yo, Adri, you have to either you go this route and you already had had a glimpse of what that looks like, or you say, I'm a, I'm, I'm not even gonna do a U turn. I'm just, I'm just gonna do a, a hard right, right? Um, and it led you to 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 be able to, uh. So let's talk about that, that hard right, going to um, uh, California and, and and using that as a transformative experience. It was, it was, to tell you the truth, it was really hard. Me playing college basketball, especially me playing playground basketball, it wasn't like, um, fundament, like I wasn't fundamentally sound. Like I said, like my passes was a little funny. The... I was really fancy with the with the passes because I, I, that's what I that's what I learned during the years playing playground. So when I got there, like they, it was like a starting all over over again. But I had, like I said, I was blessed enough that I had great coaches around me that really saw something in me and pushed me into a limit, you know. And that's when I learned my 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 work ethic by the coaches. I used to get up at five in the morning, four thirty in the morning, walk to the gym. You know, at five o'clock in the morning, my coaches was there waiting for me. So you feel, and then, I yeah. So you feel that um, that motivation came through individuals who who believed in you to the point that started pushing you more. Of course, of course, like like I, because I was playing, I still was getting better, but it, I, I, they wasn't teaching me the right path. I didn't learn at the early age. Yeah, I earned it late. So if these people was to never saw, they never would have saw something in me. I don't think I would have been here, even though I was working hard mm. towards it, but I don't think it, 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 I would have been here playing pro. Okay, cool. So we're going to close out on the college session. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Matt uh, one more question. Um, uh, and yeah, so uh, Matt, this one's for you. Um, as a closing statement, Matt, what would you say is, is, is a, t a key takeaway that you want individuals who, who, who viewed this today and youth and community members who viewed this today to be able to take away seeing this, this video. Uh, that, that they can go pro in all sorts of different ways. I'm pretty inspired listening to everyone's stories today. I mean, it takes hard work, dedication and friendship. I think uh, having a support group around you is super important in order to make it in being a pro. I mean, even as a writer, which seems like a really kind of solitary thing that you do by yourself, it's it's not something that you do alone. I have a group of writing friends that we pass work around, we talk to each other, we support each other. And as you grow up and move out of high school, I think there's this fear that you're going to be alone most of your life, but that's, or you're going to be, you know, alone working a nine to five, but you're going to have a support group and friends that you're going to be around you. Mm. And that, you know, working hard and, and, you know, grinding it out doesn't mean that you're going to be, you know, trapped and by yourself and that, and also the mistakes you make in high school don't define who you're going to be and who you are as you grow up mm. and that you can, you know, move past those things. Yeah, that's deep. Yeah, Matt, because um, I appreciate you joining us today. Um, one one, one uh, next step that I foresee us doing in the future is being able to take all these stories and potentially see how we could all collaborate 
into doing something powerful for 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 the uptown community um no i'll be talking to angie about it as well but if we could all come together and capture um the stories of it, of these individuals i think there's some powerful right there that 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 could potentially be a, a difference maker in, in society no doubt all right thank you so much matt take care all right um, so this one, now we're going over to, to you, Edgar. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, the college. So you got Edgar Sosa. I remember, um, I actually watched that Kentucky game. So uh, <laughs> you have NBA freshman years coming right off the rip, right? Um, yeah. Uh, cause you haven't, we haven't discussed college with you yet. We did the whole, uh, you did elementary, middle, uh, mm -hmm. high school. So you got yeah. Edgar Sosa coming in, uh, top recruit. Uh, you mm -hmm. have all, all these, uh, different offers. We're going to, um, I want to ask you how many offers did you get? 14. 14? Yeah. Okay. Um, and out of the 14, what, what, what did you narrow it down to? What were your top five picks? Uh, my top five, well, I had, uh, Syracuse, UConn, NC State and Louisville. That was kind of like the, the only four, like that I like considered mm -hmm. early on. All right. So, um, now let's talk about college politics, right? So, it seems like they, you, there was Louisville had a little bit of, le of a leverage because there was a player there that mentored you. Um, and you obviously, uh, looked up to the individual, right? Um, now what would you say, right. uh, you learned from that recruitment experience that you could advise to young up and coming athletes to be wary of when, uh, embarking in that situation or things to keep out, th things to keep in mind. Well, uh, you know, times have changed now from when I went to college, like, you know, coming up for, for my for my age group, the 06 class is kind of like you wanted to go to all the high majors, all the schools that played on TV two, three times a week, because that's where you was going to get seen. You know, back then it took averaging, you know, five, six, seven, eight points at a high major that would be considered better than now going to a mid-major or a low, a low major average of 15 or 16 points per game. But now the times have changed. You know, you have kids getting drafted from low majors, from mid-majors, guys going to the NBA from JUCO. So it's no longer about you having to fit into a school or to their system or to the coach or to the style of play. It's like there's so many opportunities in so many schools that now you could kind of make a school fit you. Mm. Like, all right, I, I play this way, I do this way. What school does that? Mm. You mean, it's no longer about everybody has to go to Duke, North Carolina to go, go be successful. So that's what I would say. I would say during the recruitment process, just, just find a place where you can plug yourself in and still be you and be who you are and not have to change for anybody. Mm. And then when, when we look at the scholarship conversation, yeah. um, uh, usually I'm assuming you got offered an athletic scholarship or was it an academic scholarship? It was an athletic scholarship. Okay. So meaning that if you, if something were to happen to you as an athlete, that, that there's a possibility that that uh, scholarship could be revoked. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how it works. I don't know if your scholarship has to get renewed every year since you have a four year scholarship. I just know that I was un I, I was going to college on a four year scholarship. I didn't think of, you know, what I'd be, what I get this scholarship taken away if I'm not performing or if I get yeah. injured and can't play no more, would I still be able to go to school? I honestly don't know the details behind that. I just know that I was going to school for four years. Okay, cool. So now mm -hmm. let, let's, let's fast forward. Um, you dealt with the politics, you got um, the offer you wanted, you accepted it, you announced uh, Edgar Sosa freshman year in, in Louisville. What was that like? Oh, it was awesome. It was uh, the first time I was actually on my own because, you know, growing up, you know, coming up from the environment that I come in, my dad being in jail, one of my brothers being in jail. It's like my mom and my older brother were really tight on me. I, I didn't go to parties Friday nights like people were doing. I didn't stay out till one o'clock in the morning in the streets. Like it was really basketball and home, basketball and home. So when it came to 
college, it was my first time being on my own. So I loved it, man. It was just like I was able to come and go as I as I please. You know, I'm I'm somewhere where everybody knows me. I step outside my dorm and there's people honking their their, their horns at me because they know I'm the incoming freshman. So it was it was great. My freshman year of college was awesome. I can't lie. All right. And what would you say were some how you had to mature quickly because now you have the ability to just be like, oh, I'm a slack off because I don't necessarily have these individuals. Mm-hmm. Like you say, your brother, your brother played a huge role, not only uh, mm-hmm. being that that older brother and that role model, but also making sure that you didn't miss a beat. You know what I'm saying? That you were constantly right. on top of it. What happens now in Louisville mm-hmm. when uh, you have a coach like after practice, uh, you know, you, you could do a one a day or depending on your coach, he could recommend two, three times a day. You know what I'm saying? But how were you able to now yeah. develop your work ethic on your own now? It's it's Edgar Sosa by himself. Because now and this is what I tell kids uh, that are younger than me is like every level that you go to, you're starting over. Um mm-hmm. When you get to high school, you're starting over. Nobody knows you. Nobody cares about you. Who are you? You have to prove yourself. In college, you have to do the same thing. You know, you getting there as a freshman, but there's a junior or a senior who plays point guard too. And he mm-hmm. probably, he feels like, yo, this is my chance to play. So your work ethic has to be up there or you're not going to play. And you're going to be the guy who, you know, oh, he went such and such, but he didn't play. That I never, like, that's the thing that I never wanted people to say when I went to college. I don't care if they say what they say, but I'm going to be on that court. I can't go to the guy who I can't be the guy who goes to this big school and don't get no burn. Yeah. So that drove my work ethic, knowing that the guy that I was competing minutes with, he was pretty good and he was highly touted. And he's from California, I'm from New York, We're meeting up in the middle, who's going to get the spot. So it was it was a lot of battling. And in order to battle, you have to be ready. In order to be ready, you got to work hard. Yeah, so let's talk about the kill switch because that sounds when I when I when when I always talk about it is being able to turn it on and off, right? Um, competitive That's sport right. is one thing; it's a competition. So there's no there's there's, there's no I'm gonna take it easy because that's my boy. Once you hit the basketball court, right. we battle it out. Once the score settled, that's it. Yo, what's good, my? You know what I'm saying? But let's yeah. talk about the AC Law when you played against AC Law and 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 yeah. you went off as a freshman. Uh, that's a future MB that he was. Uh, I believe he entered the draft that year too. Yeah, yeah, he was the I think the third or fourth pick in the yeah. draft. No, that 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 game was was amazing, and I get remembered a lot for that game. But like, what people don't mention that I don't care about is that I I had the chance to win the game, and I missed two free throws at the end. But just being on that stage, I just remember like you know everyone watching and. That was one of the few games that Patino just told me to go. My mm-hmm. freshman year, he told me at home versus Syracuse, and he told me that game. Because every time – I was a scoring point guard coming out of high school, so every time I would get too aggressive offensively, Patino would pull me back. Like, yeah. relax. Like, you're a po- you have to remember at the end of the day, you're a point guard. You're not a scorer. You got to make everybody happy. Da, da, da. And that's the thing where, like, people say about me and Rick Patino. We didn't have beef. I just think that Rick Patino forced me to think the game. Yeah. And I'm at my best when I react to the game. You know what I mean? Oh. So so he wanted me to think the game. But just getting back to what you were saying, that game, he just told me to go. Like, he saw that I was I was good. And he just kept telling me, he's like, you tired? I'm like, nah, I'm not tired. He's like, keep going. Keep okay. going. Keep going. And that was one of the few games. So that's what I remember about that Texas A&M game. And, and then, you know, the, the, the hype that AC Law had. You know, he was averaging 20, I think, in the mm-hmm. Big 12 player of the year, was considered the best point guard in the country. And and, and a freshman cooked him. Well, that's a nice thing. And I just treated it was wrong. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, yeah I agree. You froze uh, right there. Edgar, you froze right there. All right. You hear me? Uh, mm, you're coming in and out. You, All right, yeah. Edgar, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to go with Adris now. Yo, Adris, let's talk about um, Eastern Washington um, playing Division One, and uh, what would you say is a game that that you're always, like, there's that one game. Edgar was talking about uh, the, the game against AC. What, what would you say is an equivalent to that game for you? Like what game? Um, co- my college career. Yeah, that you were like, oh, they gave you the green light and you went off. 
my junior, like I said, my junior year, my junior year in college, when I when I left Southern Idaho, we was the number one team in the country. We lost, we lost um, on JUCO, the national championship. We lost, and then when I stayed Eastern Washington, Ronnie Stuckey recruited me. So when Ronnie Stuckey decided to enter the draft, now the team is on me, you know. Yeah. So me playing my first game at Washington State, there was the number two team in the country by that, by that time. So now I'm a, I never play that. I'm looking crazy. I just got cleared two hours two hours before the game. And see the ballet call and was like, oh, he ready to go because of my grades. So I played that game. But the game that impacted me was against Kansas. Mm. When Kansas won the national championship that year. I came off the bench and finished with 24 points. I went 7 for 14 from the field. And even though we lost by 20, I remember – I remember the coach Mario coming Chalmers up to me. In there, right? Was it that Kansas? Who? Mario Chalmers. It was. It was a lot of. It was like yeah. they had like four pro, like four yeah. five pros, and um, and columns. The point got columns too. Mm. And I remember the coach coming up to me and was like, like, if you didn't go off like that, y'all would easily would have lost by fifty. <laughs> 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 like, like you know, because <laughs> I shaved my head because we lost by like twenty five. But still, he came up to me and, and gave me prize. But that game, and when I had 45 points in college, I guess, um, I guess in, in my conference, that's the other game, too, that I broke the, the school record. So. Mm. Okay. Uh, James, let's transition over to, to pro. Um, start off with the pro talk. So now um, we could we could officially say that 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 we've been able to uh, speak on all levels of basketball. We spoke mm -hmm. about uh, the the younger when you're young, middle school, high school, college. Let's talk about the pros. So, what would you say sums up everything that you need to do to be able to wear a jersey for the first time as a pro, and not even only as a first time, but what leads you to being able to keep that jersey and still be able to play at a pro level um, because what people don't understand about the pro is you don't produce, you're not getting that call back again. So could we talk about that? The mindset you need to develop to be able to maintain that consistency. Uh, the first thing I just want is, is you got to be respectful. Um, you got to respect everybody in the club. Cause you know, in the organization, they have many people, you know, they have like 20, 30 people working with the organization and you got to respect everybody. Um, how you doing, having conversations, even if it's short or long conversation uh, with the people that work around the organization. And second, I would say coachable. Um, all coaches talk. Um, even though if, you don't, if they don't know each other, they just a phone call away because this basketball world overseas is, is, is small. So coachable is definitely one and, and hardworking. Um, you know, it's, it's always going to be a player or American or a person from that country you in trying to take your spot. Um, so it's, it's, it's those three things, I would say. Okay. And now, um, how do you keep that jersey on besides being a one-hit wonder? <laughs> you got to produce. Um, mm -hmm. All that work you've done in the past, all that work you do in the summer, um, all that extra work you do um, after practice or before practice, um, you just got to produce. Um, and don't let one game put you down. Because um, mm. I've had many bad games, um, but I've had many great games. And um, I feel like the great games, you know, succeed the the, the, the bad games. So um, just just put that work in. And, and trust me, they're they watching you when, when they, you think they, they, they're not watching you. How many countries could you say this that your pro career has taken you to? Uh, like overall or without? No, the all, 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 your, all the countries that, that you've been a pro and that you lived in. Man. Approximately, it just it could be an estimate. Um, 30, 35. Mm. What would you say is one of the best memories within those 35 countries that you've had? Oh, I've had, I have a lot. Um, so, so if you were to say, it doesn't necessarily need to reference a country, but just being able to be like, like for instance, I'm going to use an example, right? For me, when I moved to Miami and saw that the world was bigger than Washington Heights, that for me was an eye opener. You know what I'm saying? Because 
we're confined within a 20, 30 block of like radius, right? Where yeah. we think that's the world. You move to a different environment. You get, yo, for me, what was wild was good morning. The person, the house that the the woman that the woman and the guy that lives that lived next to me in that said yeah. good morning, and for me it was like, whoa, where am I? Yeah, so, yeah. Situation like that where you're like, okay, I'm overseas. I'm used to, you know, you had your college environment, but now you're in this submerging yourself in a totally new culture. Um, I want to say my my first year, I was in um, I was in Spain. I was in a city called Lugo. Um, I want to say my first week, I had a restaurant downstairs of my building and it was just, hey, James, what you want to eat? Every single day I walked out of practice. <laughs> what, time, what time you get home from practice? And I'll park my car and I'll get out and I'll see, um, I'll see them and just be like, they'll wave me in and say, your food's ready. Mm. I never saw that in my life. So I was just like, oh, okay, this is how every country is. But then also... I've been to other countries that don't even say good morning to you. Mm. And I had, co I had coaches that don't even say, yo, how was your day? Mm. So I've been, I've seen it all. Okay. So I'm going to ask the same question now to you, Adris. And then, and then I got you, Edgar. Um, hey. Adris, the same question to you. Um, what would you say when, when you entered your pro life, uh, how many countries have you played pro in? Um, to tell you the truth, I stay local. And local means like I, I like I didn't have a lot of options. Like, let me go to Argentina. Let me go to this. Like, I got blessed enough that I got my first country was Australia, outside mm. of DR. You know, because mm. I see DR like his home. Mm -hmm. I got the, the, the I got blessed to play in one of the greatest leagues that I ever mm -hmm. played. And got the best team. I went, like, I played in a in a team that was really in Miami. I was mm -hmm. by the waters. So me seeing this, and I'm like, yo, I live, like, me walking around and bumping with a lot of celebrities. Like, I saw Rihanna, Chris Brown. I saw everybody at that time in 2011, 2008. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hold up. So I'm, and they, the people treating you like a star. Like, even though I play playgrounds and all of this, me, going overseas and going to Australia and see how people embrace me when my name, not even my real name, but to all the gone name. And it's kind of like shocked me like, oh, wow. Like, you know, and, and. Yeah. And I actually liked how you, how you referenced the, the name because um, what people fail to understand is that an athlete is no longer a person. Um, an athlete becomes a brand. Right. Um, and a lot of the youth don't understand that they, you do yourself a disservice by like once you post something online this is already it stays online in one of one of these servers so eventually it could come back to back backfire uh backfire several years from now so saying yeah. that and the too hard to guard brand right um i feel that a lot a lot of people don't understand and i think like uh, you three are exemplar around uh the importance of maintaining that brand right um, whereas when I talk to a lot of youth, I let them know, like, homie, like, just understand that you're an athlete and athlete is not perceived as a person anymore. You have people around you that are looking to gain either contracts, recognition or some sort of advertisement from it. Right. So if you don't have the right team around you, what's going to happen is somebody else is going to maximize with you. somebody else is going to maximize from you more than you are from yourself. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and that is sometimes the misconception of an athlete where it's like, and I want to bring it back to too hard to guard. And when you hit Australia, which you have pictures with kangaroos fighting kangaroos, which is interestingly enough. Right. But the name too hard to guard is attached with Adris de Leon. You know what I'm saying? So regardless of whether they say your name or they say this or not even to minimize it, right. The MBL right now is becoming a stepping stone to the NBA. Because if you see yeah. a lot of the youth now are going to the NBL so they could make more money than the G League and just forego and go straight into the NBA. So that's going to be within a few years, that's going to be one of the top leagues just because unless, you know, NCAA adjusts and, and other factors go into play. But the NBL is like one of the top leagues. So I don't want you to feel like you have to minimize that 
because no, it, yeah, no, and it's even is bring even though I brought to all to God with my career, yeah, because that's who I really was, yeah, yeah, yeah. it kind of it kind of I lost a lot of job out of it. I'm gonna yeah. give you a perfect. I'm gonna give you a perfect example. Edgar, Edgar. One time he was in Iran. Edgar got hurt. Edgar called me. Edgar called me and was like, "Dries, look, I got this job for like two months. I'm trying to pay you this and that. I'm telling my coach, it's you. You the guy that we need until I get better. This and that. I never got the job. Edgar knew that I could have get the job and get the job done, but because of the background that I came from, street ball, this and that." You know, but I got jobs because coaches and people saw me and was like, yo, he could play in this league. But mm -hmm. all the coaches that don't know me personally, like James said, they only a phone call away. If they call the wrong guy, they be like, nah, he a street ball player. Now that coach going to be like, nah, I'm not taking this guy. You get what I'm coming from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though, like I said, like I was blessed enough that, that people saw something in me. I was yeah. lucky that the people I had around me, like helped me accomplish my, my dream, so. Yeah. So, so what would you say was your best experience in Australia? I think my best improvement in Australia was, um, was me playing against all these top players. You know, mm -hmm. like, like one thing us, especially coming from Washington Heights, coming from being Dominican, we play with a chip in our shoulder. We where we go, because mm -hmm. we felt like you know, like I'm outside. I'm representing my country. I'm representing my mom. I'm representing the Dominican Republic on my guy home. So we and we represent New York a lot. So when we me playing against all the players and and me winning game winners and and seeing people outside waiting for me after the games, I think that's that's what really got to me in Australia. So yeah. Um so let's go to, to you, Edgar. Um let's talk about pro now. So, mm -hmm. um, you didn't, you didn't, um, your, your freshman year, your numbers was crazy. You didn't, mm -hmm. um, you chose to, to stick it around. You went back to Louisville. Um, you mm -hmm. graduated from Louisville, right? Then you had mm -hmm. to make the decision. Where do I go now? Um, right. what was that like? Uh, it was, it was different. It was the first time in my life that I felt like I was on my own. It was like, Okay, when I was young, I had my mother and my brother looking out for me, taking care of me. Now throughout college, you know, you have your college coaches and, and the staff, you know, taking care of you. But now it's kind of like, you know, your time is up here. Like, what now? And, of course, I did the every what, what, what most seniors do. I went through the draft process and everything like that and didn't get drafted. And then after that, it was kind of like my, my agent was like, you know, you could either, you know, well, he didn't say he didn't give me the option. He just said, you know, we have a contract for you in, in Italy. So at that time, it's kind of like I had to let go of the the NBA kind of and kind of just focus on just like getting myself together. And then, you know, I started off with that first contract in, in Italy. And then it's been year after year after that. How many contract? How many uh, how many uh, countries have you played pro in? I have played pro. Well, it's been different because I've played in a lot of leagues. And some leagues you just go as a three-month league, as a six-month league. So I've played a total of nine seasons, but I've played in 12 countries. Okay. Uh, what would you say, what, what country, uh, what would you say was your most memorable country, um, your most memorable moment? You don't necessarily have to disclose mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. My most memorable moment will have to be 2015 when uh, the team that I was on, we, uh, we made history. So throughout the season, and you have you know three different tries to to get a cup and get a championship and and that year you know we swept it we won all three and that had not been done in 27 years in Italy and and that would definitely have to be like the highlight of, of my professional career for sure all right cool and the beauty of all of you all that you have been able to represent the country um at a at, at the international level. Um, every individual here has been able to play um, and represent the Dominican Republic. Um, I'm not gonna get into the politics of it, but uh, mm -hmm. I wanna be able to talk about um, one, the experience and two recommendations that you have for youth when they themselves are like, let's say in high school, trying to um, 
uh, be able to represent their country at an international level. So you could start off with that. I guess. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. For I mean, for international, I mean, that's just a. I think that's a dream and a feeling that me, Adri, and James have. You know, to represent your country, to be one of the best in your country. I think that's like a that's like a badge of a badge of honor. You know what I'm saying? And the and the. I guess the advice I will give to the youth is kind of like to have your thing together and understand that there's a, that representing your country and, and, and actually doing your job at, at your profession is two different things. Um, the love and the passion will always be there for your country because that's what you do. And, you know, you want to make your family proud and it's all about your country and where you come from, but your profession is what feeds you is what, what, what keeps you alive, what, what, what you depend on more than anything. So I would say just like to separate the both, but understand what's important to you and, and, and then choose whether you want to take that route or not. Mm. And um, I'll tap into it now since we're talking about it before I go over to Adri. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about the injury, um, what mm -hmm. went through your mind and how you leveled up. Mm-hmm. Man, well, my injury was, uh, again, a, a tough time in my life, like a defining moment for me because it's like, okay, now I'm out of college. I'm on my own. Um, I'm taking myself, and now I get injured. And throughout my career, it's just been a lot of sprained ankles. That's been the thing with me. I sprain my ankle often. But now I finally broke a bone. And the way that I broke it and how nasty and ugly it was, it was kind of like it was all like I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, and that's a, that's an injury that you don't see in basketball. You hear the ACLs and everything like that, but you never hear about a broken leg. And I just didn't know what to expect. And so many people were telling me so many different things that, you know, I, I, at the end, I just had to really, like, you know, lock in, you know, with my trainer, you know, Robinson Frias, who I, I really feel that if it's not for him, I wouldn't be playing basketball today. He Locked in and just start back, just getting the back, getting the strength. And then once you have the strength, and then it's all about getting the confidence back and everything like that. And he was he he was the main the, the the main reason, you know, outside of God, that that I was able to play basketball again. And then once I started playing basketball again, it's kind of like you know people remembered me because I had a good rookie year, and and teams took a chance on me. And then when they took a chance on me, even after not playing for almost two years, it's kind of like I made the most of it. And now that me being injured and all that stuff, that that doesn't even surround my name no more. It's kind of like you know he's a winner. He he he's won championships. You know he's a he's a good person in the community and and around our organization. So that's why I keep getting signed. I feel like yeah. So so um before I transition over to Adris, it's just um I feel like 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 what's important mm -hmm. for young folks to notice that regardless of what you're facing, your character should never change. If anything you have to look to a higher being or, or figure it out within yourself, but you should never change your demeanor and your professionalism based on the circumstances. Is there anything you want to add on to that, Edgar, before I move on to, to Adri? I agree. I agree. And, and, Oh, for sure. Uh, what I would say is that, you know, um, don't try to plan out your life because that's what I try to do. I thought, man, by, you know, by, I'm, I'm going to be in college one or two years and then I'm going to go to the NBA and have a wife and kids and da 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 Like, don't plan your life because that's like you trying to be God. Yeah. Only God right. knows what's going to happen with you tomorrow. Only God knows where, you, where, where you're going to end up. So what I would tell the youth is something that I really didn't do is just to enjoy every day and enjoy the moment, living today. Stop thinking what's going to happen to you tomorrow or five years from now. Plan for it try to prepare for it, but also soak up what's going on today in your life because those are times that you're never going to get back. All right. Adri, um, let's talk about um, being able to represent your country at the, at, at, a, at the international level. You, you did it. Um, uh, you're doing it. Not even did it. You're doing it. Uh, and you're able to, to, to put in the work and, and, and represent, right. As a Dominican, particularly from Washington Heights, uptown, right. Uh, being able to wear that Dominicana shirt, uh, must feel, uh, out of this, like you must feel something out of it, you know? 
So let's talk about that. You froze, Domingo. I couldn't hear you. Oh, oh. Um, so let's talk about uh let's talk about what it feels like to play for the national team. Um, so you you you're a certified pro. You played, you put in your numbers, like uh Jay-Z said, men lie, women lie, numbers don't, right? Um, now you're representing not only yourself, but you're you're taking the the Dominican uh identity and and playing competing um in its name, right? So how how does that feel? And yeah, let's talk about that experience. I mean, that experiment is amazing, especially Europe country, especially a kid that would that was born in the Dominican Republic, you know? That's what everybody looked for as an athlete, represent your country, be one of the best players in your country. Like me, everywhere I go, I represent my name, family, and in my country, where I'm from. Because if I start being bad or if I do something bad, they're gonna be like, this Dominican kid, you know? He's gonna yeah. bring Edgar, he's gonna bring James, he's gonna bring everybody from the Dominican Republic. But everywhere I go, I always try to represent where I come from. Washington mm-hmm. Heights, Dominican Republic, my friends. So me playing in the national team is, is amazing. Yeah, I'm still playing. And even though I have bumped heads with Tom in a lot of different ways, like I would never, I would never let anybody take that away from me because mm-hmm. I'm really doing it because I really love it. You know, I like Edgar said, like, this kids need to just enjoy the ride. Live the moment that you live playing basketball, studying, playing with your friends, your childhood, like whatever you're trying to do. Just enjoy it because you, you you're not gonna have it back after you pass your 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 childhood and stuff like that. You become a man. You don't want to have no regrets, and that's what I did. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed every ride of my career. Like I I will never I will not replace any of the moments that I went through, playing the national team, being with my friends, getting locked up. Like I like I like I said, I've been blessed enough to to have a career playing basketball and still having fun doing it. So. Mm-hmm. Adri, let's talk about um when you tore your ACL, I believe, a few. No, 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 no. My it wasn't Achilles, my Achilles. Achilles, yeah, Achilles, yeah, Achilles. Let's Achilles. talk about um that moment, uh, what was going through your mind, um, and and Adri after that, the the the. Let's talk about that. It's funny because like the when I was on my prime, I'm still in my prime. Let me fix that. <laughs> <laughs> but when <laughs> but when when I was like I got hurt in Australia coming from the finals I, I lost in the championship like my last game I, I had a fraction on my foot then I came home I, I had surgery it was like two months I got fixed whatever then I came back again and got hurt again and the next year and then the next year after that I got hurt with my Achilles so I I lost three years back to back to back without everybody knowing. And the big one was my Achilles. When that happens, I already knew. Since it happened, I was like, I'm done. I'm done. Started crying as a competitive. I went home. And I was blessed enough that, my, like I said, my mom, I got a strong family. They home me down. My mom was like, worry about it. I think it's going to get better. And I took it as a challenge. Like, like I said, if it wasn't for Rob and the way he thinks and see things, like I, I, I wouldn't play basketball because this injury you can come, you can come from there. Like coming from Achilles is a tendon that that really balances your body and people just as soon as you do that you need to retire. So Rob really pushed me to a limit that I, nobody know how hard it was and and I appreciate him for that. But I feel like what the best thing that happened was that. That that is, it, it changed my whole game completely, and I and I got better. I got better in a way like my game developed to a level that after that I ended up playing in Europe, and I never did. You know, I never played in Europe. Only my first year against James, and I didn't go in back seven years later. And after I did that, I went to Europe. I went to Australia. I played better, and I had a better career after my injury. Than I had than I had at the beginning. So let's go. Let's go now to James. Um, James, <laughs> same question. Let's talk about how how did it feel? Um, I believe when y'all played, this 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 like memorable picture that I seen where I think Edgar's giving you a behind the back pass, and I think uh, 
Kyrie or, or Curry was guarding uh, one of the two. Um, and, and, and yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, playing for the national team, representing your country at the, at the highest level. Hold up, James. I got to mute you. All right. There you uh, go. Yeah, so, I mean, them two stories is they, they top of minds easily. So, I mean, that, that, that was, that was great about them. They, they opened up. So respect to them for sure. Um, but like they said, you know, it was, I never thought that I was going to be able to represent, you know, Dominican Republic on the, on the national team. Um, you know, it was, it was, it wasn't a dream of mine, um, but then it became a reality real fast when, when I started becoming better and better over time. Um, but I just wanted to represent when I had the opportunity, you know, I asked my mom and my grandmother, um, what should I do? And, and they wanted me to do it to represent their, their country and, and you know, our family name and, and stuff like that. So it felt good to, to have them watching me and, and, I, got, I gave them jerseys and pictures of me wearing Dominicana. And, you know, another factor was, you know, playing with Edgar in the backcourt. Uh, we, we, we didn't do that so often um, back in the day. So that was another thing that I really, really wanted to do in my career. So having that for like five years was, uh, was really special for us. And, you know, playing in the Garden versus USA in front of family and friends and basically the whole Washington Heights um, was, was crazy and a time that I'll never forget. Uh, I, I was I was trying to look for it, but it doesn't seem like you've ever had a major injury. Um, what? How, be looking, don't be. Looking oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I had to, to you know, that. Google, Google. Um, so let's talk about how do you prepare your body? How do you feel you condition your body to be able to prevent? Um, sometimes there's situations that uh, are that 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 are unforeseeable, right? Uh, like the whole. Yeah. Um, like when Edgar, went, yeah, when Edgar went down, you know, um, when Andre went down, these, these are things that just happen, but you also have to be able to prepare your body as well to be able to sustain the, the, the every days of being a professional yeah. athlete, a professional mm-hmm. athlete. So what would you say are one of the um, most important uh, workout uh, techniques that you're constantly doing? How many times a day do you work out? Um, what are your techniques and, and how do you identify if this, the, the workout uh, was, was what you were trying to achieve? Like if you hit the point that you were trying to achieve during the workout. Uh, first off, you know, us, us three work out with the same guy, Rob, um, in New York. We, we all do. He has a weird workout for us and he knows our body pretty well. Um, so he, we just work out with him. I worked out with him um, for like four years straight and thank God I haven't had an injury um, like that, um, like they have. So um, I don't, at this age, I probably work out one time a day. I I don't do two a days no more. I used to um, when I was, when I was younger, but not anymore. Um, But just having like a a group of guys and a group of, uh, a person that wants to work so bad, like Rob is a person that Man, he, he's not doing a workout with us, but it, it feels like it, the way his energy is and the way he talks us through the workouts and pumps us up and, you know, he hypes us up and, and gets us, he gets us ready for the season. I right? mean, he's still doing it to this day. We, we do workouts on FaceTime. I see Adrian there all the time. You know, me and Edgar work out together every morning. Um, so it's just having people around you and, 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 and him knowing what to do and, and knowing our bodies. All right, cool. So with that being said, we're going to start doing our, our final our final thoughts. Um, and I'm going to start it off with you, James. Um, mm-hmm. Understanding the trajectory, understanding your timeline, we, we brief, briefly went over um, every single uh, what I would consider key steps throughout your life. What would you say is an, uh, a, an advice that sums up what you need to know to be a pro basketball player? Make your own path. Don't worry about what for example, me, Adri, and, and Edgar doing, um, you know, we're we here to, to, to help. Uh, but at the end of the day, I feel like make your own path. It, it doesn't have to be in basketball, I'm saying in life. Um, just figure out what you love to do, what you want to do in life, and pack it. Hmm. Deep. All right, uh, let's go with you, Adri. Um, let's talk about uh, your... Let's talk about the final thought. Uh, we, we've been able to go over every step of your life um, briefly. Uh, let's talk about what you would 
consider understanding everything you experience when they ask you what it takes to be a pro how would you be able to answer that you broke up you broke, i couldn't hear you um so basically uh, we're, we're we're providing our final thoughts so with you right we've been able to to get your trajectory from youth to college to pro right now understanding that and all of your experiences everything sums up to your final thoughts on what it takes to what 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 does it take to be a pro i mean dedication you know like like i said um you love something so much that you would you will do anything to 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 do it you know but for me as a pro and the highlight of my whole career was me graduating from college like mm. i would never take that away for anything like me like wearing that clothes um looking at my friends and like calling my my coaches being happy for me and putting that diploma in my wall like i i would mm. never like i could score all the points i wanted to even though because i love the game of basketball i knew that basketball was going to be my dream even though if i wasn't doing the right thing but i never saw myself graduating from school you know and mm. i understood like if i want to play basketball i need to go to school and mm. i end up getting a diploma and they can help me at the end of my career so for me i really really that i really passionate was me getting that diploma at the end of the day so mm. Mm. that's deep all right um uh same question to you eger um understanding your trajectory um understanding everything your experience uh what what would you say uh it takes to be a pro I just think it takes a lot of hard work and and perseverance. I think uh when you're pursuing something, it's not going to all be pe- peaches and cream. You're going to hit some, some bumps on the road. You're going to hit some times that that you want to give up and you don't want to keep going. But if your dream and what you're trying to become uh means that much to you, then you you wouldn't stop. You know what I'm saying? And and um and I'm a just I'm a firm believer that if you really if you really want something when when the road gets tough you don't fold you keep going and that's the only I think thing I would tell the youth that trying to get to what to what you want and where you want to get to is not going to be easy it's not like you're going to be let's say basketball for instance you're not going to be the best in middle school best in high school best in college and go and be the best in the NBA if that's who you are then congratulations LeBron and Michael Jordan it's going to be tough time but you're going to have to dig deep and there's going to be no one around it to save you or to push you and you're going to have to do it yourself and and I think if you have those things that that you always want to work hard and always going to get better I think you know life will figure itself out for you and now that we're done with the pro talk let's talk about um and this is the final question um let's talk about life beyond basketball um not necessarily uh i think i agree with what you said we don't necessarily plan for every single day in our lives but we try to lay out mm-hmm. a blueprint that helps us build every day of our lives you know yeah. what i'm saying so everything we're doing is construct constructing not necessarily directing us you know what i'm saying so mm-hmm. uh with that understanding edgar um i'm going to start this one off with you uh what would you say mm-hmm. are uh things you look forward to doing after your career's over Oh man, after my career is over, I feel like uh I'm just going to be so happy to be living in the states full time. I think that, you know, there's a lot of players that, you know, they go overseas and they fall in love with their lifestyle, but for me home is always going to be home. So I think in the state I would be great. Um just having a second career, I think it's so important for me and something that I think about now because you know, life goes on. You're not going to be playing basketball for the rest of your life and you know uh, if you if you lucky and nothing tragic happens you have another 35 40 years to live and you know you have to provide for yourself and you have to find something you have to find something that's that you know that you you can do to provide for you and your family and provide you know the things that you're into and the things that you like so it's just kind of like that's where I'm at with it it's kind of just like pre- trying to prepare myself for that because I know that I'm closer to the end than I was at the beginning is Edgar Sosa contemplating becoming a coach Would you are you contemplating um it's in the future as of right now and the egg of sauce I am today I don't I don't want to okay 
I don't want to. Well, I want to go, go like, like, you know, for, you know, I wanted to how that works and being a real estate, you know, investor and, and, and how good things could come from that. But I'm still learning. And that's another thing I wanted to tell the Jew, the youth. I'm 32 years old <laughs> and I'm still figuring it out. Uh, that he is, is older than me and he could tell you he's still figuring out. There's no, I, I don't want the youth to attach age, like at a certain age, I should be here because that's the way I thought. And then when I act, when I speak to people who's, who's older than me, they be like, bro, you're bugging, bro. Like I'm, I'm 10 years older than you and I'm still figuring out my life. And you mm -hmm. over here breaking your head over things that, you know, that you can't control. Life is going to, come to you whenever it comes to you. You just got to be prepared for it. Exactly. Just maintain, maintain growth, but not necessarily, uh, be, 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 uh, be, be, in, be, be changed. Like obsessed about yeah. where you should be in life. Correct. Forget that food. All right. Um, James, uh, let's, let's have your final thought, uh, moving beyond basketball. Where do you see James Feldine in life? Be, uh, beyond basketball? I mean, I got a few more years left in my tank. So um, I'm still trying to figure out, like Edgar said, um, you know, we have this conversation maybe twice a week um, on just throwing ideas back to each other and just trying to figure out uh, meeting new people. You know, we moved from New York. So um, I'm trying to learn the community, trying to see what I can do. My thing is I'm just trying to find like a second love, which is going to be mm -hmm. tough. Um, I never want to compare anything else to basketball, but, you know, I want to do something that I love. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, so I want to find that that same passion um, that I put into basketball with my second life. Mm -hmm. And hopefully um, it'll come soon, but I'm not I'm not really too pressed about it. Um, like I just said, life comes when it comes and and I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to be ready for it. And hopefully I figure it out soon and, you know, just take it day by day. Mm -hmm. Thank you, James. Uh, Adris, close. You're gonna close us out um, with with the same question I asked uh, again, James, which is, uh, where do you see Adri beyond basketball? <clears throat> oh, espera, Adri, hold up. Go ahead, talk. Uh, tell me again. Uh, where do you see Adri beyond basketball? <laughs> To tell you the truth, like um, I, I just, like I just said, like I really don't don't gotta figure out. But mm. like I'm 35, and like James said, I've always looked to. I'm passionate about things. I love the game of basketball. I would love to keep doing what I'm doing with the love of basketball. But I see myself like doing stuff with with my family, doing businesses. Like my dad got a construction company. I'm trying to get into that. Just to like, get away from the game and see if I really miss it so I could come back to it. And that's what I've been thinking all these years. Like, let me just do something different so I could just see if I really want to do this because I don't, all my life I've been doing basketball. I never had a job before because <laughs> I've been blessed to play basketball. And now I want to do something else. So I could be like, you know what? This it ain't for me. I'm going back to what, what I'm really good at and teach and help kids and whatever God help me figure out. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna stop the stream now. Hold up.